All right. So listen, ladies who are watching this episode, um, I brought on Tina here to make sure that we had the female perspective, but we're going to go into this question, this age old question about why women complain about there being no good guys left while they summarily friend zone all of the good guys. And we're going to, we're going to ask the age old question. Why do nice guys finish last? And, and honestly, I, I might, I might even suggest in this that maybe, maybe nice guys deserve to finish last. Really? Maybe, maybe that's a thing. We're going to, we're going to oh, analyze, yeah. we're going to analyze all of that today. And we're going to actually, we're going to actually make some differentiation between what do women really want? Why do certain guys get put in the friend zone and, and what does it take to actually be a good man? So we're going to discuss all of that and more on this episode of making the argument brought to you by good ranchers. I'm telling you, I am excited about today's episode because I could use an episode on this topic while I was growing up, probably through like middle school, high school. So I think there's going to be a lot of value presented to some young younger guys from this episode. Um, and I'm also excited to see what conversations take place in our community chat. Oh, I, I think the community chat's going to get interesting on this one. Uh, um, speaking of the chat, the YouTube chat, Christian Hines in the house. Hello, oh, Master Hines. Yes, let's let's all let's all we got to do our introductions as always. I'm your host Nick yep. Freitas. Uh, with me, my beautiful bride uh, Tina, Queen of the Bees. Hello, everyone. Not with us today because the professor Master Hines um, has reinvaded. Reinvaded Great Britain to give them the old what for. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and bring. Can we bring up the yep, picture real quick? Up, it's up. Liz, There's he, Christian getting his master. He's with us online today, but he's not with us in person. But look at this picture, dude. That's ladies. Yeah, Nick said he looks like Moriarty. Like, <laughs> yeah, I do. You do. That just, just does give it off a of professor Moriarty. Did you feel. go to villain school and get your master's in villainry, <laughs> master of doom? <laughs> I'm just saying right now, I think, uh, okay, again, we're going to let everybody in the chat. We've been fighting for like months now to figure out like, what is the best name? We got queen of the bees. We got the good Hamilton, but what is the best name for Christian? And, and there's been plenty of, of solutions offered master of Dune, master Heinz. Now that he does have his master degree, the professor, the professor of doom, uh, the mostly benevolent warlord, like all of these things. But, uh, anyways, we're, we're sad he can't be here today, but we're both very happy for proud him. Of him. Very proud. He put very in proud so of him. much work. To he this. did. He worked his butt off. He, he was, yeah, he worked really hard. He did even, a great job. He even put off work, our, our work. For he, this. I, 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 I will say, I will say he doubled down all of it, did a great job. And, uh, yeah. we are so proud. All also, you're fired because I can't believe you would give into the higher ed industrial complex. So <laughs> as proud of you as we are, we're also so horribly disappointed. No, no, we love you, brother. Have a great time over there. Congratulations. Well earned. And we look forward to having you back. And then, of course, we have our producer of producers, the good Hamilton, right. the one that doesn't like central baking. How you doing? Let's do this. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into this. So we're going we're gonna to start off with something a little bit funny. Um, I, we, we, the language is bleeped out. Language is bleeped yeah. out, but there was, there was a bit of a joke that we came across that was funny. And this was from Ryan Long and Ryan Long is a comedian that has kind of a, he has a reputation for going after all of like the politically incorrect stuff you possibly He does could. all the anti-woke comedy. Oh my God. It's hysterical. It, re it really, I get, I can't always recommend the language. We always try to keep things, you yeah. know, we, we try to keep things family friendly, except when I was gone. And then all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> but, um, but this, this is kind of a funny thing we just wanted to show uh, because it's Ryan Long comedy and he's talking about what a girl says her standards is versus the guy she actually dates. So let's, let's go ahead and throw this up real quick. What I look for in a guy is someone who makes like $500,000 a year, about six feet tall, compassionate, strong, but soft, likes to spend time with me. Oh uh, yeah, I'm unemployed right now. I got a couple Deweys, so if you want me to drive, you got to blow into the breathalyzer because I tied a few on earlier, assuming you got a whip. Mature and a great relationship with his mom is a must. Mom's a fucking bitch. I don't even really like living her. We got in a huge scuffle the other day. I almost got physical because she caught me stealing her jewelry after I was pissed at her because she wouldn't let me use her picture to start another Uber Eats profile after I got banned from eating someone's food and I wanted to take another crack at it because I already <laughs> stole a bike. Honest. He's definitely got to be clean. That's a non-negotiable. I actually got little man picking up some toilet paper from school for me right now. Do you think you could drive me there after this? Also, you might have to pop in there and grab it just because I can't really show face there right now. X is still a little perturbed with me because I owe her a couple G's and she needs that for her tuition. Someone who likes to travel. Yeah, I know. She asked me to get a suit for some destination funeral. It's like an hour out of town, which I did, but then the security tag had a miss 
this up and it got a little messy, so she might have to just go dolo on this one. Willing to cook and just sort of spoil me. Yeah, I like to treat my bitch. I take her to Ruby <laughs> Tuesdays. We probably have to go to one of the ones out of state, though, because some of the local ones I've dined and dashed too much at, so they're a little bit on to me. A man with integrity. Babe, could you drop by my mom's place and pick up a half quarter from there? Yeah, Dave's plug's gonna come by and pick it up in like the next half hour. You want me to sell drugs for you? It's just under the mattress <laughs> on the floor. Don't take any though. No, last time I went to your house, your mom tried to fight me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So again, I, we we realize it's a bit of a character, but it is well, it is kind of funny. Is it really though? Like I can't tell you how many girls, you know, you'll see. There's the good the friend that's almost. You know how there's sort of the designated mom friend. Uh, amongst women, there's the designated mom friend. She's the one that takes care of everybody else and makes sure that oh, they, okay. you know, they, they're all, uh, you know, not not in any danger at Got any it. time they go out. Well, um, that's the sober friend in the group, right? Or? And and so yeah. usually that's the friend that's got her head on straight, and she's the one that's telling her uh, friends who are just constantly just having guy problems, guy problems, their relationships never last. And there's always some kind of cheating that happens or whatever, some dude. And um, the friend's always giving advice like, hey, you know, you need to <laughs> maybe not go for these kind of guys and, and all of that. And inevitably, another guy pops up and it's like, oh, but he's so different. And then it, it same cycle all over again. And they're garbage. These are like trash dudes that these girls are going for, but it's because, and I'll tell you, it's because they're super confident and they're willing to get out there and like actually put themselves forward and kind of act like they don't care whether you say yes or no. Like they come on real strong yeah. and then they're like, oh, well then forget you. And then it makes the girl want them. It's the weirdest thing. And and I don't, I don't know if it's daddy issues or if feminism has like broken women or what has happened, but... It, well, it, it seems to be a cycle a lot of these gals go through, and and uh, and they're never listening to their their friend that knows what's up. Yeah, you know? but there's okay, there, there's the friend that knows what's up always finds the good guy and stays with them. It's the gals, it's yeah. the gals that won't do that, that won't take the advice, but they want to sit there and boohoo on their friend's shoulder. Okay, well let's look, let's look at this. So let's go to this next article because I looked this up and I thought it was really interesting. It was why do girls like bad boys? So scroll all the way up to the top here. All right, so they, they've got multiple reasons here. Yeah, top 12 reasons why girls choose bad boys. All right, so we're going to go through this real quick. Scroll down a little bit because some of this you already mentioned, but bad boys are usually assertive. All right, so a bad boy isn't afraid to speak his mind, which most girls find sexy. While nice guys try to please everyone, bad boys don't care what other people think. They pride themselves on being honest and upfront, which increases their attractiveness. Being authentic is more appealing than being overly nice, and girls appreciate when guys are unapologetically themselves. True. Wait, Tina, true, false? Uh, I would say, yeah. Okay, number two, they're dangerously exciting. Dating a bad boy is an adrenaline rush. They're mysterious, adventurous, and more likely to engage in risky behavior. It's not surprising when they end up in sticky situation, but that makes them even more intriguing to some girls, especially if they're looking for someone to spice up their life. Wait, wait, don't, don't, just come, calm sorry, down there. Sorry. Calm down there, Hamilton. All right, go ahead. What do you think? Yeah, I, all I can do is, is, is say that's probably, that's probably true, and I don't know, I, to me, I look at some of this and go, there's something lacking in the girl if she thinks that that's what she needs. And I kind of almost, I, I wonder, is is Hollywood to blame for this? Because there's always, there's always that um, movie sort of plot line where it's like, it's he was the bad boy, but she tamed him. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, oh, he, he turned away from those ways because she was what he really needed. And so women seem to think that they are the answer. Yeah. For this is how she's going to tame this man. Well, and can we, can she's going to be the reason he settles down. And it's like, no, no, no. And, and, and so I feel like it's been a, a false bill of goods sold to women. I, I think there's so I think there's actually a bit of a false bill of goods, but I think there's also an element of truth. And I think the element of truth is, is that this whole idea that, you know, um, men civilize the wilderness and women civilize men. I think there's truth to that. I think there's truth to that. If you if you look at like the let's look at the West. Yeah, but the man has to have honor for that. To no, work. no, I, I 
Yeah. I get that. I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting otherwise. But I am saying that th- this is the problem with most of this stuff: is that underlying all the bad decisions, there there is something elemental there that can be correct. The problem is, is when it has a negative manifestation instead of a positive manifestation. So a, a guy that is is willing to be maybe spontaneous or exciting, that might be something that you really appreciate, especially if this is like an opposites attract sort of thing, where you know it, it makes a girl feel special or a little bit of excitement because otherwise. That's that's just not an element of her life. But the question is, is what sort of, de- what sort of things does he do in order to bring that excitement? Is it dangerous and counterproductive and, and you know, everything else, or is it something that's exciting, but can also be positive? So I, I think there's an element there of a woman saying, I, I'm going to civilize that guy, which can be true. It's just, you're, you're not, <laughs> if the guy is just a horrible human being, you ain't Yeah, that's that. true. And, and so there's going to be like a, a big spectrum here. So you're going to have the guys that'll do like dangerous things like, oh, they're really an adrenaline junkie. And so they go like cliff, you know, diving and they jump out of airplanes and they do all this like outdoorsy guy stuff. There's that kind of danger. And then there's legal danger where they (laughs) might- Let's rob this liquor store. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) they they might get in a fight later on and and she might um, be used as a human shield. Yeah. Uh, You know, so uh, I think that, the desire for adventure exists. That yeah. does. And and women like the idea of being pulled out of whatever predicament they're in, especially if they're not liking their situation right now. Sure. They want to be pulled out of that into something exciting. Yeah. And so sometimes these guys, what they're offering is excitement. And she hasn't realized yet <laughs> how exciting it's going to get. And and a lot of times it's the, scary. Theodore, Theodore Dalrymple, um, who, again, his real name is like doc, Dr. Anthony... Um, Daniels, who was a, um, I want to say sociologist over in Great Britain. I've talked about him before. His book, Life at the Bottom is excellent, but he talks a lot about, he will have female patients um, that are either through the, you know, prison system or ones that have been victims of domestic abuse or whatever it is. And one of the things that he will ask them is if your boyfriend walked through the door right now, how long would it take me to know that he was a bad guy? And he goes, the answer I usually get is you'd know instantly to which he usually responds. He's like, okay, then presumably you know this as well, so why is it? And he goes, it's not as if they haven't had relatively stable men in their lives. The problem is, is that the stable men don't provide the element of excitement they're looking for. Right. And so they, they choose something else. But And again, here, there is a wide spectrum because yeah. there's a reason why like serial killers and men who've killed their wives and men who've killed their families and all that, they all end up with these creepy groupy women writing them letters and like wanting to get married and bring them conjugal visits and all this. Like there is a spectrum of really deranged women. And then there's a a spectrum of deranged men and and it's a wide swath. You've just got to try to find your vein and, and go there. Well, again, there's, 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 I look at the whole idea, like Brian was just talking about this in the chat as well. There, there are things that are, if the fundamentals are good, then yeah, there's going to be elements that, you know, you can be civilized within the confines of a relationship or, or things like that. If the fundamentals are good, if the fundamentals are bad, then yeah, that's probably not someone you should try to invest a lot of yeah. time into to, to fix, at least in a committed relationship. All right, I got a question. Yeah. Last time Lily was on the show, I asked her if it was true or not that women look for qualities in a man, which help them determine how confident they are in the long term. Uh, relationship and the stability of that. And Lily gave a great answer to what those qualities were that she looked for in her future husband. But this seems counterintuitive to that. Yeah, it does. Because um, everybody's been fed this line uh, in the past many, many decades now that um, this certain portion of your life is meant to be adventurous and fun and you should go test everything out. And so none these women aren't looking to settle down just yet. In fact, they kind of like the idea of finding this guy that they think is dangerous or whatever. And, and, and somehow she waves a magic wand and he's just so enthralled with her that he's willing to go to the ends of the earth and turn his back on any of the bad things. And And then she gets bored of him and leaves. Right. But, but, (laughs) but I will say that, um, like I married a soldier, right? Like Nick's not a bad boy, but he is a tough guy. And so. I think sometimes women get mixed up with what they really want. I think they well, let's don't. not jump too far ahead right now because we got it. Like let's we still got like I know I know. But I was, I was go just going to say there was a time when Nick was going to get out of the military and he's like, 
I don't know, maybe I'll be like a real estate agent or something. <laughs> Nothing against real estate agents, you guys. But my husband was a gosh dang Green Beret jumping out of airplanes and like fighting in wars. And he's like, maybe I'll sell real estate. And I'm like, really? Wow, babe. Nice to know if I would have made that. I wasn't going to leave oh, you. No, no, no. It's nice to know that if I would have made that decision, like eh, all the spice would have like, gone. I'm like, you're going to do that, but are you going to do anything else that's like kind of cool? Oh, or? gosh dang. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to come up with the equivalent and yeah, <laughs> on that. Like, oh, so you're just going to do this? All right. Number three, they make girls feel protected. Now, this one, I, I think there's, again, this is one of those elements where there, there's something there, right? Bad boys stand up for their partners no matter what. Most bad boys are eager to engage in confrontation, especially if it involves their partner. Whether it's an inappropriate comment, look, or touch, a bad boy is always ready to protect um, his partner from harm and let the perpetrator know they messed up. I, I think this, stop moving the screen <laughs> It's it's Negan. Oh it's my why, gosh! Why all these women went for Negan in the zon that zombie? Well, no, the, the reason why they went for Negan in the zombie show is because he mercilessly ruled over his little group and That's forced true. them. But, yeah. No, the, but the whole idea of making the girls feel protected, right? This is this is something where we're going to get into this a little bit later on the whole difference between nice guys um, and and other options for women, right? Is if you're nice but you don't make you don't make your your girl feel safe. Well then, yeah. There's there's something significantly lacking there, and and that's problematic. Um, by the same token, you you will see this where the the bad boy, which differentiates the bad boy from the good man, is the the bad boy will make her feel safe until he doesn't, right? Because he's now the the source of violence, and you you will you will see women try to come up with excuses for well, it was my fault. I did this. I said this, and and all of a sudden it becomes Stockholm syndrome. Go ahead and scroll down. They're seen as more masculine. Now, here's what I love about this. This is wiki how, right? It's not like this is, you know, some, some ultra manosphere, red pill, conservative group. It, it's just, this is just a reality is that women want masculine men and super nice, touchy feely in, you know, in touch with their emotion, high EQ men, some, for some reason, right? The very thing that feminists claim to want once they get it. They cheat on that guy for the dude that's more masculine. Or, or I, I'm convinced that women want that in their imagination, and that's pretty much where they want him to stay, is up there in the imagination. They will compare every man to that thing in their imagination, but when they find that guy that actually fits that, that's not what they want. They want the guy that's tough and scary to other people so that she can, you know. Now, here's, here's, what's, here's what's interesting. <laughs> Listen to this. I love, I love the way Wiki Howe is describing this. Bad boys exude confidence and dominance, increasing their appeal. Whether it's strength, courage, or leadership skills, bad boys encompass most, if not all, of the typical masculine qualities. Oh, Golly gee willikers. Gee. I thought, I was told those were toxic. So perhaps we should be masculine again. What do you think? Oh my gosh. It's a, it's amazing how when they're moving outside of the realm of this political woke garbage and they're actually just getting down to, okay, well, let's explain the ac reality as we actually find it, not as we pretend it exists in the sociology department at Berkeley. All of a sudden, the whole advice and the reasoning changes. And when people read this, it's like, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> Scroll down. All right, so that's number four, five. Five, girls may enjoy chasing bad boys. You don't say. <laughs> Some bad boys send confusing signals, leaving girls wanting more. While there's nothing wrong with dating a nice guy, it can get boring and predictable. A bad boy gives a girl attention one minute, then takes it away the next, and this behavior can intensify her feelings for And him. so all these women, Holy then God. they go on TikTok and make videos about how they dated a narcissist yeah. and how you deal with narcissists. It's like, well, you went and you chose a freaking narcissist. Yeah, yeah. Well, and... <sighs> This is also this is also kind of an interesting question with respect to how things like um, popularity or competition affects um, affection, right? So uh, obviously, women want to be desired, right? And and if a lot of guys are giving a girl attention, then I, I would imagine in her mind it's like, yeah, yeah, I, I've, that, that's all secured. Yeah. But why isn't that guy paying attention? Why isn't that guy paying attention? And look, I, I say this as somebody that I, I did. I got friend zoned in, in high school. All right. So you're, you're, Same. you're not alone, but I got friend zoned in high school. Um, and part of it was because I looked at it as like, well, my job is to be chivalrous and, and nice and honest yep. and, and, you know, all this other stuff. And then I, I realized my senior year, it's like, yeah, maybe I should just 
back off the being nice a little bit. Not 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 like fundamentally bad, but just back off the the niceness a little bit because it becomes you're either a sure thing or you get walked on because you think you're being chivalrous when in reality you're just getting you're just getting treated poorly. Um, go ahead and scroll down. Number six, they're portrayed as attractive in the media. Yeah, that's true. I, I think. Um, I, I, again, I think some of this, there, there's, there's actually some decent biological reasons why, you know, the whole bad boy image or whatnot. But I think also within the media, the bad boy is often treated as the guy that he he's good at heart or he's, he's good on some fundamental level, but he's got either a dark past she or just has to get in there yeah. and ignite that light inside of him in order to make all the badness <laughs> yeah. go away. And then she can convert him into that little ideal in her head, yeah. but he has to keep all the bad, like enough badness to where he's fun and cool. Yeah. I think what it is, is it's like chemically, it's like. It, women, I think maybe uh, uh, our brains are made in such a way to be attracted to the strong man. Yeah. And so sometimes the bad guy appears to be the strong man, especially in a civilized society. Yes. And so since society is so civil and, and, and all of these men have fallen right in line and they all consider themselves feminists now and everything yeah. else, um, you know, women are like, well, all these dudes are emasculated. Well, there, and- there was a really interesting conversation between, um, Jordan Peterson and, um, uh, Gad, I think his name was Gad. I can't remember, but he's, he's a, uh, again, I think he's, a, I think he's a psychiatrist or, or a psychologist. I can't remember, but he was talking about this whole concept of the, the, the term is bad, but it was the sneaky, you know, F word. Right? And the whole idea was he goes, no, I don't mean this is like a pejorative term. It's actually, it's actually describing something that we see going on within biology. And that is, yeah. that is when you have the alpha, which, which all the women like, right. The, the question becomes, they were, they were analyzing, I think it was certain, I think it was chimps. It was these chimps they that- were analyzing chimps and they thought these chimps were either underdeveloped uh, or they thought they were young males uh, at first because you know, they just yeah. hadn't developed. And what they found out is, no, that was a fully developed male. The difference was, is that they could not compete with the alpha. And so the way that they were able to get access um, to, you know, you know, is right, through sneaky rape is through, well, and not just that, but through, um, through basically blending in with the females in the yeah. bunch and not drawing too much attention from the alphas. And they were able to get like the, you know, again, in the animal kingdom, it's not like they were taking them out to dinner or braiding their in, hair in for In the them, animal but, kingdom, it's pretty much all rape. Yeah, but it was, but what was interesting about it was the idea that it was almost like the, the sympathy, you know, the sympathy sex. Yeah, or, except it's, it's kind of not. It's like, basically they would, they would display the um, aggressive, like, force thing to, no. to the females. Yeah, it wasn't, well. What I think is interesting. It wasn't about, like they were giving him like pity sex. No, yeah, I know, because it's the animal <laughs> kingdom. But yeah. what I'm what I'm saying is that when we when we now apply this over to to humans, um, I, I've seen I, I've had buddies of mine that were absolutely the sort of like alpha male types, and they used to think it was something of a game to go after like very progressive uh, women because they believed that they were so they they were easy to get in bed and they were very easy to manipulate. Uh, cause they knew what to say. They were, and again, I'm not saying this is true of all progressive women or anything like that. I'm just saying, no, but there's a reason I Parks a lot, and Rec did that. I where had they, a lot they of had the, Everybody went out and like, everybody's trying for the, this woman and she's like this hardcore fem- feminist. Yeah. And then Ron Swanson's just totally <laughs> disregarding her and ignoring her the whole time. And, yeah. uh, and then, you know, she totally says no to this one guy that's all in Rob tuned. Lowe's character, Rob Lowe's. He's all in tune with his care, his yeah. feelings. But then, uh, she tells, well, it was funny because Ron, Ron, like, you want to get out of here? Ron, yeah, it's funny because she's like a women's studies professor and they're all they're all at dinner because Andy just passed her class, which was pass fail, right? Typical. And then, yeah. And then Rob Lowe's sitting there and he's brought his own dressing that he made organically from home and he's talking about, you know, and he's so kind feelings and in Cincinnati and, and he's a good looking guy and he's in shape and the whole deal. And he's like, hey, would you would you like like want to get coffee sometime? She's like, I just got out of a really rough relation. Oh, I, I totally respect that. I totally respect that. At the same time, Ron Swanson just ordered his third steak. Right? So Rob Lowe gets up and leaves and she immediately looks at Ron and goes, so you want to get out of here? <laughs> Yeah. So, but that's the thing is this would not be a stereotype that, uh, that the entertainment industry exploits. No, if it didn't 
sort of exists in real life. If it you know, didn't, if it, I have watched women go shooting that are so scared of guns. Yeah. And um, I've watched them go and see their guy starting shooting a gun. Um, and just, you could just see something in her face just changed <laughs> watching him handle that gun. <laughs> and it was like palpable. Nick and I are like, do they need like some space? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, yeah. Oh no, it was, to we, it. we had some, I won't, I won't name them, but they know who they are. We had, uh, we have some really good friends where, um, they went out to a trip on Wyoming and he came out wearing a, a cowboy hat and tipped his hat at his wife. And she looked at him and went like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> very, very all right. So let's go to, go, all right. So they're portrayed as attractive in the media. Now I will say this. One of the big problems with this is again, the way the media attracts the bad boys, it's the idea that the bad boy is always easily reformed. And that's obviously not the case in reality. Go ahead and scroll down. Bad boys can inspire girls to speak their mind. Um, Many girls are taught to always be nice, which can be extremely frustrating at times. If a girl doesn't feel seen or heard by others, she might look for a guy who makes her feel validated. A bad boy is the definition of a free spirit, and he can encourage his partner to embrace her emotions and unlock her wild side. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Go. Yeah, especially if she feels really repressed in whatever like role she has found herself in, I would imagine. Yeah. You know, depending on it. I mean, did she come from like a small town where like she just wanted to always get away or get out of there? Boy, that sounds like a Hallmark commer uh, movie, yeah, doesn't right? it? Yeah, right, yeah. All right, bad boys may increase a girl's self-esteem. Okay, I want to delve into this one a little bit more. Temporarily. Being with a bad boy may make a girl feel more desirable. Since bad boys are perceived as unattainable, landing one can be a major source of validation. Some girls use bad boys to confirm their physical attractiveness or sexual appeal, especially if they have low self-esteem. This is one where we get into the whole idea of of women competing with one another. And and we see this a lot. Um and this has been brought up before when, when you ask men what they want out of, let me reword this. A lot of times what women complain about as pressure from men is actually pressure from other women. And so when you look at, oh, these, these unattainable beauty standards or this or that or whatnot, it's like, okay, when was the last time a, a, a guy said you looked fat in that? Or when was the last time a guy said, why don't you have more lip filler? Or when was the last time a guy? And, and a lot of guys have been pointing out that, look, it's not that we don't appreciate a, you know, a, a, a good looking dress or someone that puts themselves, it's not like we don't appreciate that, but there's a lot of things that women seem to do that seem to be more for other women in the sense that they're competing with those women or they're trying to avoid um, censure or criticism from other women, as opposed to, you know, some sort of unrealistic demand that has been put on them by the men in their lives. That's true. But men also do the same thing on their side. Yes. Uh, they're, they're always competing with other men. Women are competing with other women, yeah. even if they say they're not. And um, yeah, I mean, there is this challenge focus that women sometimes can have. I mean, it's to me, the idea of this going for the bad boy, that's the challenge. There's a challenge there. It's a challenge to domesticate him. Um, but then there's there's other challenges women go for too. You know, women, there are, there are whole swaths of women that go after married men. And the reason they go after married men is because they see it as a challenge. He's already desirable enough for another woman to be married to him. So he must be one of the good ones. And maybe she could pull him away. And there are women that just straight up do not have a problem with going after married men. And it's a challenge. It's a conquest situation. Yeah. And so men aren't the only ones who view things with like sort of a conqu conquest ethic. Yeah. Women do too. And this idea that we don't and the this idea that women are all good and pure and wonderful is is such a farce. I have seen very, very, very toxic behavior in some, you know, areas of femininity uh, of females, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think the other side too, is the whole increase of girls' self-esteem. What, what's interesting about that is that I, I do think both men and women obviously get a sense of, um, a, a sense of like security and for lack of a better word, pride with respect to, you know, their, their, their wife or their husband or whatever uh, it may be. What I, what I also think is interesting is when you also look at infidelity, when you look at infidelity within marriages, um, a lot of it is not rooted so much in like the, the, the idea I think that Hollywood portrays sometimes this idea that when infidelity takes place in marriage, it's because somebody was just so much more attractive or so much more appealing when in reality, a lot of times it's more of an appeal to their self-esteem. So if they're, if they're feeling like they're, they're not desired and now all of a sudden they are desired in this other area, that's far more likely to trigger 
and infidelity, just statistically speaking, than than somebody was just really good looking. Um, and so that's it, it that's is kind of interesting when you talk to. I I've known um, some women in the past who got cheated on by yeah. their spouses and all, and um, you look at the woman; they'll show you who they cheated with, and you're going, yeah. "This woman is not even as pretty as the wife." Yeah. What happened? What? So it's not about looks. Sometimes yeah. it's about what makes the man's self esteem feel boosted. Yeah. All right. Next. Go. Next one. Number nine. Dating bad boys can boost a girl's reputation. Well, this kind of goes into what we were talking before is that some of this is not about the actual individual themselves, the guy itself. It's about the status with other girls. Mm -hmm. Uh, Go ahead and scroll down. Girls may choose bad boys. If they're looking for a fling, this, this is one. All right. I I will say that I think this is the one that frustrates guys the most. Um, And, and I'll tell you why it's, it's because if a guy really, let's not even say the whole nice guy characters, right? Cause we're going to get into the whole difference between nice guy and good man. And, and what, what, what's the difference between these two things and how they behave in different situations. We're going to go point by point on all of that, but this is the one, and this is one I would just tell, I would, I would tell both men and women if the whole idea, like if, if you're, if you're a man and the whole idea is, is that you're hooking up with the club girl just for a fling, that is diminishing you. I, I don't care what I don't care what the manosphere says. That that diminishes you with the sort of woman that you actually want to marry, and and that is that is also true with um, the women. If if it's the one thing where it's like, oh, I'm going to hook up with the I'm going to hook up with the you know the the bad boy or or now they call them the f boys and everything else. I'm going to hook up with that guy just for fun and a fling, but nothing serious. And then you're going to now present yourself to the guy that you actually think is is the pinnacle of what you want you are diminished as a result of all those hookups. And, and it's also true for guys too. Like I'm, I'm tired of this whole idea that it may affect the dynamic differently culturally, but ultimately if you really want a woman, they, like the, the pinnacle of what you expect out of a wife, she is not going to appreciate the fact that you decided to hook up with a bunch of, you know, club girls before you decided to quote, settle down with her. Yeah. And that, that's a part of this, this narrative that I absolutely cannot stand. And I, we did a video on this a while back on getting married young where I said one of the dumbest things that modern culture tells us is you're supposed to go out and experiment and figure out what you like. And one of the dumbest statements I've ever heard is, well, determine if you're sexually compatible. That is so idiotic. Oh, you always hear people go, you wouldn't go and buy a car without test driving it first, would you? And I'm just going, uh... Yeah. This, this is not the same thing. It is yeah. just not. No, it's it, it, and it's yeah, and it, it's not. And it's, yeah, anyway, there's a lot of bad jokes we can say with that. But I just want to say, like, this, this is part of the thing where you know, rather, I'm not saying people need to get married young or anything like that, but I do think it's it's proper for people to understand that there's actually something really important that goes on with respect to actually identifying someone that you want to have a relationship with. And if and if you packed in your early 20s um, with nothing more than a bunch of, you know, sexual trysts and conquests, well, then understand that does diminish you toward the ideal of what you might actually want. And you should, you should understand that. And, and culture lying to you saying, well, that's just prudish or that's just, no, that's a reality. Just like a lot of other things that have become unpopular to talk about, but are, but are real. Um, it's not to say you can't overcome that. It's not to say you can't, you know, but that's baggage and you are bringing that baggage male or female, you're bringing that baggage. Um, it's, it's real. It's it's very unpopular nowadays for for women to be um, highlighted for like th- this whole. There's this thing called slut shaming now. Yeah, and it's like, oh my gosh, you telling somebody that they can't just go and like be with the entire football team. That's slut shaming. You you know what I mean? And and there used to be a reason why we viewed that with a certain degree of negativity. Is is it's it's dangerous behavior. It, it's it's indicative of something wrong mentally. There is something emotionally broken that yeah. makes you think you need all of that, and yet we're not supposed to to look at it, any of it. It's it's just oh, it's just casual. It's just gratification. That's all she's doing this for. And it's like, I I don't buy that. No. I do not buy that. Well, and 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 look, if you're if you are if you are seriously looking for compatibility. Um, well then, I've got great news because Good Ranchers, Good Ranchers is all about uh-huh. all about ensuring that you have the proper compatibility with the sort of meat you want, right? So, oh my god, if you want what what I don't understand why this is controversial. <laughs> all right, so if you are looking, if you are looking for like an excellent 
combo pack. There, there are new deals now with Good Ranchers. New deals. New deal. All right, Hamilton, do the new deals. What yes. are the new deals? Okay. So for anybody that subscribes to a new box, they're going to get a free 10-pound ham worth $99. That's pretty great. Yeah. That's in addition to the steak that you're already purchased. Yeah, this isn't the ham you're picking up at the at the local chain store either. Like this is this is quality ham. You're going to be compatible with this ham. It's a Good Ranchers Heritage Farm ham. Heritage hams. Excuse me. Let me make, do that again. <laughs> Good Ranchers Heritage Hams are pork done the right way. If you miss one for Thanksgiving, you can get it for Christmas. Yeah, so think about it. You go there right now. You're going to get a disc. If you use promo code Nick, go to GoodRanchers.com. You're going to use promo code Nick. You're going to get the finest quality rate. This is this is meat, beef, pork, poultry raised in the United States. We've talked about this before. A lot of stuff that you see at the store that's labeled you know, American beef, it isn't. It was raised somewhere else. It was shipped to the United States. If they did anything to quote, like enhance the product, now all of a sudden it's an American thing. That is not the case with Good Ranchers. It was raised here. It was grown here by American farmers and they create a quality, quality product. So take advantage of that discount. Get that ham. Again, you're going you're gonna to be compatible with this ham. You're going you're gonna to love it. You're going to love it, right? Don't mess around with yeah, that cheap meat. Don't mess, yeah, don't, mess, don't mess around. Don't go to the store and like you know have a bunch of flings with subpar meat, <laughs> right? Go directly to GoodRanchers.com, use promo code Nick, and get only the quality meat that you know you're going you're gonna to enjoy and be compatible with, all right? Oh, they are so going to pull their sponsorship. <laughs> yeah, is it good? All right. All right, let's look at this one. All right, number 11. Here it is. Finally, we've talked about everything. Some... Girls want to fix bad boys. All right, so we're going we're gonna to talk about this a little bit more later, so don't get into the other side of it. What is the allure with fixing? What do you think is the allure with it's fixing bad boys? It's the challenge. It's the conquest. It's the conquest. It's the challenge. It's, it's t- women want to feel victorious in something. And if she, they don't want their man coming to them already emasculated. They want to emasculate them themselves. (laughs) And so that's what this is. Okay. So let me ask you a question on this. Cause I'm curious. There there was, I was was watching one of those, I was watching one of the the manosphere things where uh, again, this, this girl was, this club girl was sitting there bragging about like, Oh, you know, this guy wants me and this guy wants me and that guy wants me. And finally this dude looks at her and goes, Stop telling me how many men are willing to sleep with you. That's easy. Tell me how many men are willing to marry you. Yep. And all of a sudden, everything went quiet. It was Crickets. like, oh, but it was it was true. So here's my question: for for a lot of times, and again, I think this is I think this is an inappropriate cultural norm. But for man, the conquest is getting the woman to sleep with him. It feels like sometimes for women, the conquest is turning the bad boy good or, or, or something like that to commit one or, or getting him to commit to you and, alone. Okay. Yeah. And so it's, I think ultimately women that go for the bad guy, um, you know, if it does, it, what's weird about some of this is the minute the guy seems like he is changing and softening and doing all of that, she starts to realize that maybe there's some other bad guy out there she could go for. Yeah. You know, it's, it is, it, it is something broken in the emotional, uh, you know, realm somewhere within that woman. I, I don't think that that this is a healthy... No. Like, women that go for bad guys, ultimately there's something wrong with this woman that she always attracts bad guys. I mean, there are women... <clears throat> uh, it's There are women that end up, like, for instance... Um, now, this is not victim-blaming. Yeah. But there are certain traits in certain women that attract bad men and that and that could be abusive men too. Yeah. Sometimes you'll notice there's certain women that like they're always with abusive men, like they'll leave one abusive relationship and end up in another one. Which is sad. Right. Yeah. And and it's it is because and I, I'm convinced that there is something that predatory people can clue into in somebody that's broken. So like she has something um, that sort of attracts these predators to her um, that is broken. And and who knows who it was broken by? It could have been a father. It could have been an uncle. It could have been, she might've been sexually abused as a child. There's yeah. a lot of reasons mm-hmm. why um, a woman, someone would spot that brokenness and want to exploit it. And, um, and so I think sometimes much in the same way, but in a different way, in, in a different um, area, the whole attraction to bad boy is similar. There's something um, wrong. Well, it's it, she is not processing things correctly. Like yeah. her desire is to be 
with a strong, capable, like, um, like a man who can pr- protect her that that is going to be like an alpha male. That's what she really wants, but it's like this twisted, skewed version of that because something in her is broken. When a lo- and a lot of times, too, you see this with an absence of fathers or with abusive fathers or with just neglectful fathers where all of a sudden there, there's never been any, they haven't had it modeled for them at all with respect to how they saw their mother being treated or they saw their mother being treated horrible and just, this is just normal. This is what it is. Yeah. Or sometimes it's the desire to escape that particular environment. And, and you're it's also for- how the father treated the daughter on the way up. Like yeah. growing up from from young and, and up, it's how her interaction with the men in her life growing up and especially the father. Yeah, let's let's get we're gonna get to the last two questions. We've got some super chats we want to get to here. So let's go ahead and scroll down. Twelve. Some girls seek bad boys to cope with past trauma. So that's essentially just what we we talked about. Scroll down some more. Um Oh, is that it? It was a 12. Okay, 12. All right. So there we go. Those are the 12 reasons that WikiHow came up with with why girls are attracted to bad boys. Um, and again, I I mean- they, been, they forgot the part where it's like, because they're idiots. <laughs> like, come on, be self-aware. Well, again, we're going we're gonna to kind of go after the guys here in a minute too. So uh, let, let's go ahead and go to the uh, super chats here. Got a couple super chats. So Rod Line, thank you very much. I am an artist, not bad guy, not nice guy, nice guy, sort of in between. I'm emotional, but not a pushover. My wife found the mysterious artistry type attractive. Well, mystery th- that yeah. you clued into it. It's the mysterious. Yeah. Uh, women love a good mystery novel, and so they would love a good mysterious man. Yeah. When and and you you see that when and, and again. It, the joke is always the guys are very, very superficial with respect to what we want. When we have the capacity to think about nothing and all we really mm-hmm. want is you to show up with food and, you know, there is a that's certain ab- uh, amount of like safe mystery, I guess. Yeah. In, um, in a person who holds inside their brain, like all of this creativity and beauty and they can like, they can get it out on canvas or they can get it yeah. out on paper or how, whatever Avenue or in song or whatever, type of artistry it is the idea that all of that beauty lives inside that person's brain and you never see it until they get it out is there is some like beautiful mystery to that when you'll you'll see it too when when a when a woman kind of serves as almost like a a muse too for like an an artist where that artist is enhanced by the relationship that he has with that woman that's they're inspired by something with her that's an incredibly powerful reason why like taylor swift has to have a new boyfriend every five minutes so that she can get good material for her (laughs) next big breakup breakup. uh song stuff okay uh jgj thank you very much i'm 28 and have not been able to find any woman interested my folks expect me to be with another south indian but when most girls in the demo have strands of dark blue hair ideologically i feel out of place and then he gave additional context i come from an arranged marriage culture been following you on twitter for a while love the discussion no hey thanks very much uh uh jgj i appreciate it um yeah this is one thing where christian and i um we we actually kind of we got we kind of had a a bit of a dust up off camera once um because christian was telling me verbally yeah verbally verbally but um Christian was telling me, he's like, you know, Nick, he goes, I got to tell you, I'm a little bit sick of constantly being told that I'm just not doing enough or I'm not this or I'm not that when I don't think you have any concept of what it's like being a 20 something year old man in today's culture and environment, especially with the way that, especially with the expectations that are being created with women. And, and my response is, dude, not all women are like that. He goes, okay, well, that's great. But it, it, but if the supply of women who don't believe that is significantly smaller than when you were looking for a wife, then you don't have a healthy appreciation for how difficult that has got this has gotten. Where where now you have now you have a whole bunch of women that were taught by feminism that they were going to go assert themselves by going out there and you know racking up a body count and doing those other things, and then finally when they figure out and maybe they've got a kid or something like that that oh crap that was wrong now I'm going to look for the guy to settle for I'm I'm the guy you settle for screw you. And I, and I sat there and I, I listened and I was like, dude, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, 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 I let my pride get the better of me for at least 30 minutes and yelled back at him. But then I came, I came to the conclusion that no, he had actually made a really good point that, that the, the number of women that have bought into this and, and I, and I speak of it this way because I do believe that a big part of the problem is, is that when you have a, a you know, teenage girls growing up in an environment where they are being told by their, um, mentors that, that this is what, this is what represents true femininity and true feminine power and true feminine, you know, individuality and all this. And you don't need no man. 
obviously they're going to, they're going to start to believe some of that. Just like you have a bunch of young men that are listening to other men right now that are probably buying some things that are going to cause them problems later. They're going to find out that, Oh, I don't have a bunch of sports cars and big houses and a bunch of supermodels in my house. I'm just a jerk, right? Just like some other, you know, women are finding out that, Oh, I'm, I'm not strong and powerful and independent. I'm lonely and I'm miserable. I think the other thing also to point out is at the same time when people are super like, uh, not to harp on Christian or anything, but when he was upset with you for all of that, um, there is still the point of your swath of women that are going to fit the good criteria is also very small if you don't go where they are. Yeah. You have to go to the places these women exist. So if you're having a hard time finding a woman, you know, in the club scene or in college or, you know, in the big city or whatever, maybe you need to shift if you're really truly looking for a woman yeah like a real woman you need to go to the places where you might actually find those women not the you can't go to like a pool of of all like basically a salmon farm and <laughs> hope that you find a bass you're, it's a salmon farm yeah. you're not gonna find a bass there do you see what i'm saying you're <laughs> I'm not sure that's what I, I would have used. Well, I use the, it's the fish in the sea. It's the fish in the sea analogy, and you're okay. not going to the sea where you could find a wide variety of women. You're you're in college you're, where they're all the same. You're in the wrong and hatchery, <laughs> and you're in clubs where they're all the same, and yeah. they all have been eating the same. No, sludge. but I, but I, I here's what I think. Here and, and to JGJ's point, right? The the frustrating part is that it used to be, and it wasn't that long ago, where you would meet your you know your future wife at church or at work or in college. In fact, that became a very, very common thing for decades now is that, you know, you'd go off to college, you'd meet a girlfriend in college, and then you guys would get married. And I, I do think it's becoming more and more difficult, especially within the college scene, because l let's face it, most universities now, especially, I, I would say, especially in the West, I can't speak outside of, of that, but I understand the context there because although I won't be next year, I'm currently the chairman of the subcommittee on higher education. So it's not like I'm unaware of what's going on within university campuses. I can't claim to be there every day experiencing it, but I would say that I probably have more insight into what's going on within our college campuses than, say, the average 44-year-old dude that's not in college. And, and he's right in the sense that our universities are now set up to not just provide you a credential within a particular area of uh, a field or, or subject matter expertise – they are completely bought in, like from top to bottom, completely bought in to creating a particular idea, ideological person. They don't want just a good architect or a good doctor. They want an ideological architect or an ideological doctor. And if you find yourself in that environment where it used to be that you could find a wife, not to mention the fact that you're probably dealing with a lot of pressure from parents because that was their expectation. That was their experience. And it's not yours. But to Tina's point, I think the thing that is is frustrating. So I'm not I'm not trying to suggest that it's it's fair or just or anything else. It's just reality. And the reality is, is that if, if you are looking for a certain type of woman or a certain type of man, you got to go to the places where you're most likely to find them. And yeah. unfortunately now it's probably not the university system, right? It's it's I would argue that probably 99 times out of 100, it is not the club yeah. or, or the bar. I mean, you can always find. Or the uh, festival or whatever it you is. You can always find something that breaks the rule, but it, in large part, yeah, it's it's a pretty solid assumption that you're not going to go to the club and find a good Christian girl. Yeah. No, it's, and, and so it really, it, I think it really is something where, again, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I try to be more careful in acknowledging the the difficulty of the situation, but the solutions are still the same. That's the problem. The solutions are still the same. And one of the things that we're going to find is that we are going to create a better society when more men learn how to be good men, not nice guys. Like I said, that's going to, we're going to get into that in a minute. Yeah. Um, by CVA uh, Buck here, grew up actual nice guy, not Reddit stereotype. Life pushed me into bad boy turf. Now I'm balance of both. Um, have women chase me, but can't get it right. Widowed on first, divorced on second, then a string of five, three to five year failures. Uh, follow, follow up now 42 and still want family and kids losing hope quick. I mean, CBA buck. I mean, look, it, that's, I, I mean, I can't imagine, um, you know, the difficulty of, of being widowed and, and what that would, you know, what that would, what that would do to me psychologically. Um, and, and so I can, I can imagine how difficult that is in that environment and to be in this situation where you're, where you're trying to find someone again, the, the only thing, the only thing I think I can say is um, once again, it's about 
it's about understanding what you're looking for and, and looking in the right places. And let me let me give an example of this that I know a lot of people are going to instantly smirk at. Um, but I'm, I'm not saying it is a common example. I'm not saying it's an example that's open up to, you know, everybody or even a, even a plurality of people. I'm just offering it as an example. And, and I'm, I'm not going to say church, even though that's usually my favorite example. When we went to the Homesteaders of America conference, yeah. all right, we would like Hamilton Chris, is over here like Hamilton, <laughs> Hamilton. I'm sorry. Can yeah. we get Hamilton to yes. chime in on this a little? What was your view of the women that you saw at the Homesteaders there, convention? There was no point throughout the whole year of 2023 where I was surrounded by more potential spouses. Yeah. That's yeah. just, just the case. I was really busy. We were selling mugs, everything. Yeah. So I didn't get a lot of time to... You know, but there are a lot of pretty girls that were single coming <laughs> yeah. to the booth who had the right set of morals, the right kind of like oh, plans they wanted, for the future. I mean, they were they were they were confident, they were strong, yeah. they were independent, but they knew what they wanted, and they wanted a you know traditional kind of man that with was going to protect cow. and provide you know, with the baby <laughs> cow, right? Like, and and but and so again, I realize that is not a common thing for most people. All I'm saying is that here was an example of. You went into an environment with a certain culture associated with that environment, and all of a sudden, there was a lot more people that you would have said, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And like Hamilton yeah. just said, it's not like Hamilton's a homesteader. No. Right? Hamilton's yeah. not a homesteader. He's not a, but. I think there was one gal, you were actually going to try to see if you could uh, reach out, but I don't know if you ever made that connection. She, she she ended up not being single. Oh, oh yeah. Dang. Oh, well, hey, dang we put it. in the work. Yeah. yeah. Christian Hines, can I ask for a girlfriend for Christmas this year? Not for a one ninety nine super chat. I mean, you, <laughs> <laughs> what sort of place do you think this he is? He already answered that. He said, "I'm a fiscal conservative." <laughs> <laughs> Two dollars. Oh my gosh. Hey, look, I'm I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna totally call him out, but um, there's there's been there's been some yeah there's been some uh. There's been some interest, you know, for you, Christian. You've got to probably take the next step and, you know, I don't know, step up and actually call the girl. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go into this next thing. All right, so this is what I'm going to ask Tina this question, and then Tina has a question for me after we get an S in that one. All right, so. Are you really ready for my answer? This yes. Go any why do you guys, why do you guys get relegated to the friend zone? Why? Uh... You know, there are a lot of reasons a guy could get relegated to the friend zone. Some of it is if he's like falling all over himself to try, like over eager. Yeah. Um, and why is it over eagerness? Because for a guy, they may be thinking, wait a second, I'm just demonstrating to you that I'm really into you. So why, okay. why, what's the difference? Okay. Here's okay. I'm going to try to explain this and I know it's going to sound weird, but there is something in a lot of guys that get friend zoned. Yeah. where it's almost like they've got the girl on a pedestal and he almost makes it really clear to her that she'd be doing him a really big solid if she would go on a date with him. Yeah. And so it's almost like he he's like, oh, I'm such, almost like, like a groupie would be, you know, yeah. where it's like, I'm such a big fan. And it automatically puts him below her. Yeah. When you go to her and you're like, looking at her like she's this amazing unattainable thing um she's or some almost like celebrity status because you're so interested in her or whatever it appears like you don't have your own confidence in your own stuff together and so it makes it appear as though you're beneath her you're putting yourself beneath her so, so some of it is um you have got to even if you don't feel that confident, you have to project the confidence and you also can't show it. <laughs> like you've got to kind of keep it together and not show it if she hurts your feelings or, and, and also, um, you can try again if it doesn't work out, but, and then the timing is really important, but the biggest one is, um, she has to be physically attracted to you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes girls just not everybody finds everybody physically attractive. So it could be that she's just not that into you. It could. It could. <laughs> and and also, is she a girl that just got out of a bad relationship and now she's sharing all this stuff about this bad relationship with you? Well, at that point, she's not ready for another relationship and you may be a really nice shoulder to cry on, but if you're going to try to make your move right then, um, you're just going to be the rebound guy. Okay. And and you've got to let it breathe. So let me let me ask you a question on that one because it, again it's it's the whole element of and and this is something that 
you, you see on kind of the Manosphere shows or whatnot where um, you'll see women talk about like, well, I want relationships are 50, 50. And then the guy asks, he goes, so do you want a man that is taller than you? Yeah. Do you want a man that can defend you? Yeah. Do you want a man that makes more than you? Yeah. Do you want a man that does this? Yeah. Do you want a man that does that? Yeah. Okay. And you don't do any of those things or, you know, and, and you don't, you don't have a corresponding complimentary. Well, then you don't want a man that's equal to you. You yeah. want a man that's, that's actually higher status than you. And that was yeah. the point that they were, they were bringing it. Now we can have a, we can have debate all day long about complimentary components, which I think is key to a, a good relationship, yeah. but it, it, it was interesting. Um, and what do they call it? Hypergamy? Um, I think that's the term for it, where, where women want to marry someone above their status. Um, and so the idea is if you act over eager, you're signifying to her that you don't value yourself. Um, you don't value yourself at a level that would be, you know, you know, worthy with, with her. And so why is she wasting her time with you? Yeah. And, and can I also say guys notoriously get uh friend zoned with crappy women. You really need to change what That's you're looking point. for. That's a good point. Yeah. There's a lot of women, like if she's off dating all kinds of other men and she just keeps you sort of as a, in yeah. her back pocket, as a shoulder to cry on, she's not for you. And you could do so, so much better if you didn't go for somebody that was going to go get ran through by every guy that's six, four. <laughs> all right. Real quick. I got a uh, two comments here <laughs> from earlier in the chat. This one's from intensive care bear. Oh, she said, Intensive Care Bear is one of our favorite people, by the way. Yeah. Right. She said, uh, were you friend zoned or were you told no? There's a big difference and people use friend zone pretty fast and lose yeah. these days. She followed up and said, sometimes guys complain about being friend zoned, but buddy, I don't even want to be friends. Just leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> that is, you know what? Okay. Totally fair. And when totally women are fair. that honest, that it does the guy a huge favor. So yeah. like for women that are listening to this, um, <laughs> Don't keep a guy hanging. Just, okay, here's a here is something women do, and I will. I Can I give her a super chat? I know <laughs> that was awesome. Women do this thing where they want to let a guy down easy, so she sort of strings him along because she doesn't want to yeah. hurt him. Yeah, and because she doesn't want to hurt him, it's like he's still sort of on the hook. Sometimes, if you just cut him loose and do it like just with indifference and yeah. just go, this is not going to be a thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. And there is no chance. Yeah. Then you're going to do that guy a favor because then he's not going to be running after you like some little dog with his tongue out. He'll actually be able to go and find somebody that will treat him. No, and, th and that's, and, that, and that's a good point. And again, we're going to get into this on part four, where we talk about difference between nice guys and good men, because it's going to be great. Because this Andrea brings up a really good point, right? Tinsip Carabur brings up a really good point here. And that's the idea is like, look, you, maybe you weren't friend zone or maybe you were friend zone because the girl didn't have the heart to tell you this ain't ever going to happen. And maybe you should take a hint. Yeah. Right. That's, that's like, fair. I fell into that in high school all and even <laughs> all the time where it was like, I really cared about some of these yeah. people as a, as a friend. And so then I didn't want to hurt their feelings yeah. and it's it, but you just, you have to just let them have their feelings hurt. Don't string them along. Well, look, look, yeah. Cause Tina had a, Tina had a very, she had a way to do this in high school. And basically all the boys just had, we had to fight in a gladiatorial tournament and I won. And that's why she's married. <laughs> that's not exactly what happened. Well, but, pretty close. <laughs> no, I, I, no, but, no, but the, the, the point, the point though is, and, and here's, here's the other part of, of this. I, I think a, a girl being honest with a guy that like, look, this isn't going to happen. The other thing too, the girls I think have a hard time understanding is guys very, very seldom just want to be friends. If there's been, it, it's one thing True. when, when, it, when a guy is friends with a girl, we don't, it's, we, we don't go and hang out. We don't, unless it's like a friend group. But if a guy is giving one girl a lot of attention, it's because he's interested. It's not because we're, we're just gal pals, right? That's if, not a if thing. If we needed a friend, we'd go find another dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, <laughs> what's my favorite thing about women? They're not dudes. <laughs> 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 At least that used to be true. <laughs> well, I, I think one, one comment on this, I was talking to my brother the other day, and he's obviously of the, of the dating age. And he had asked this girl out, and she, you know, kind of told him that she would go out with him and then texted him and said that, that she just wanted to be friends. But what I told him, I was, I was said like, you really need to get down to what was your goal in that yeah. interaction? Was your goal to be accepted? Was it to get a girlfriend or was it to put in the rep? And I, I yeah. think, you know, for men that, you know, are in situations where it's difficult to find a potential spouse, we have to be like, my goal 
And my metric of success in those interactions is, did I put in the work? Did I make the effort? And if it didn't work out, that's fine. But I did my job what I needed to do in that moment. And if it doesn't work out on her end, fine. But I'm going to go, you know, put in the next rep. And I think that that's okay. We got two super chats. Yeah, let's let's go. Well, we got great. three actually. Let's do these three before we move on to the next question that uh, Tina's going to ask me. Uh, Isaac Gorski says you don't have to be lonely at homesteaders only. It's very true. <laughs> let's hope people don't start an only homesteaders like. <laughs> Maybe they should start an only homesteaders. It's, it, like, it's just women like baking. Maybe that's a, <laughs> an idea we just came up with. That way, only homesteaders. Yeah, that's what it is. It's basically cottage culture, but it's it's women fully dressed doing what? stuff like. Caring for a child. Although, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the guy cooking videos that are like, those oh, are thirst traps. Dude, there's some funny ones too. I, oh, hold there's. On, hold on. What is cottage culture? Cottage, cottage culture. Core. Is, cottage core. That's what, what is it is. That? It's the women who they, they're, it's like they're getting back to sort of roots. And, and it's the idea of, uh, they wear the cute little dress and they make the dough and they make. And, and a lot of it's those old fashioned. And, and they do it all while they're all like, Pretty fied with their okay. hair curled okay. and, and it's kind of like the the little like old school like uh, the cute like dresses corsets with you know, the dresses uh, yeah. those cute yeah. dresses right. that Nick right. would probably love for me to get I've a I've of. I've I've already ordered some <laughs> <laughs> he's kidding Merry you Christmas uh, oh yeah no I'm totally kidding <laughs> <laughs> Christian Hines says let's be honest my problem is that I have no idea how to talk to women Christian if are you paying attention Tina's telling you how to talk to women so just my gosh. But good job on up in the super chat. <laughs> all right. 499. Let's Jay, go. He's, he's getting more serious. He's good. All right. JGJ says also thoughts on passport bros. Psyop for immigration. Had my sister tell me that I should be a team player and get a girl from a homeland, a green card. <laughs> here's, here's what I would say. Here's what I would say on the whole passport bros thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to admit right up front. I don't know all the ins and outs of this. My, here's my understanding. So when I speak to this, I'm speaking to my understanding of what it is, not maybe what it actually is, right? I'm admitting my ignorance here. My idea of that, what I understand about passport bros is it's guys that go overseas to a culture in order to find a wife that will probably it is more in line with what they expect out of marriage. Traditional. Yeah. So they're going to a place now, listen, where traditional values are, are more, are more trained yeah, in women. There's a lot of bad things that can happen with respect to people traveling overseas. I mean, there, there are, there are huge issues with human trafficking. There's huge issues with, you know, you know, whatever slave, you know what I'm talking about? I'm trying to avoid yeah. certain words so we don't get you know in trouble with YouTube. But um, I, so I'm not, I'm excluding all of that from this. So when I'm, when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about the mail order brides and stuff like that, where again, you're, you're, you're falling into a huge areas for abuse. But if someone were to say, Hey, look, I, I'm looking for someone that really wants to be a traditional wife. And I want to, I want to go to a culture where that exists and actually spend the time and get to, you know, know people over there and find someone that could, you know, and I want to go for the purpose of finding a wife. I don't personally see anything wrong with that. I think it makes sense. To, I think it makes sense for a lot of guys who are looking for more of a, a traditional, you know, marriage environment and can't find it where they're currently at because the West has convinced women that this is bad and oppressive and mean and just a tool of the patriarchy. And, and so I mean, I, I certainly don't see anything wrong with saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to go into an environment. There are whole dating apps meant for that. Yeah. The, the, again, the problem is, is right. when this. It can be exploited. Yeah, big time. And, and that's where. But just like any any dating app can yeah, be exploited as that's well. That's where if you're going to do something like that, I would suggest. And, and you're kind of in an ideal situation, I'm assuming, right? Because I, I think you're going to school in the U.S., but you, I think that's what you mean here by give a girl from Homeland a green card. Um you know, it's the whole idea. Uh, honestly, too, I kind of find the whole concept of arranged marriages, as I understand them, um, in in uh, India and other places, pretty fascinating. Where I think some people have this idea that what an arranged marriage is is the parents pick your bride or or pick your husband or whatever it is. When in, in reality, as I understand it, it's actually more akin toward, you know, families are um, the families are play a very heavy role in the process with respect to selecting someone, but the the potential groom or the potential bride can say no. Um, and really what it is, is about narrowing down that field. Now, again, I'm not saying that always works well. I'm not saying that status and other issues can't come into play, which could yeah. be damaging status and money. And but I, I do think, I do think that we have this tendency in the West to just automatically dismiss this as if it's just a horrible, archaic, you know, idea when in, in reality, there's, there's reasons why some of this stuff was put into place that I think could actually be beneficial. I'm not advocating for it, but I just think it would be better for people to understand it before they you know, opine on it. Um, the shipbuilding observer. Thank you very much for the super chat. 25, no relationships, six dates with only one 
Second date, always go out on a date, go seemingly well. We make plans for another and then ghosted. No idea where I went wrong, just left in the dark. I don't, uh, this is part of the problem with me getting married at 19, babe. Well, is that a- <laughs> Well, that's, that's the thing is, um, I think sometimes people think it went better than it did. Okay. And, and so, um, so this, how do you key in when a girl, how do you key in when a, a, a girl is genuinely interested in opposed to being nice? You, you've got to kind of study women's facial expressions a little bit and, and their body language. And so sometimes there are times when guys will get, you know, on a tangent and they're talking about something that they're really, really interested in and they are not paying attention to whether or not she's listening mm-hmm. or whether or not she's really that interested. And so giving verbal cues like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, okay. But if she's not asking you any questions, yeah. she's not very interested in what you're talking about. And also <clears throat> there are times when uh, you could get into conversations that maybe you find really intriguing that she finds a little off-putting mm-hmm. or or maybe you talked about things uh, together that she maybe wishes she wouldn't have talked about, yeah. um, maybe opened up the book a little too much and on the first date kind of thing. I mean, I'm just saying if there's anyone, here's the piece of advice I would give you. If there's anybody that would, that you trust to be completely honest with you about your behavior and your personality um, and, and ha- whether or not you rub people the wrong way, yeah. you know, are you abrasive in some way or are you a little weird in some ways? And is there a way that you could tame that just a little bit um, to get so that somebody could get to know your heart before they get to know how yeah. weird you are. You know what I mean? Just a little <laughs> bit. I mean, not, I'm not saying you're weird. I'm saying that yeah. we're all a little weird. And usually we uh, reserve the weirdness for after we're a little more comfortable with each other. And so um, I think sit down with somebody that will tell you the truth about what's a little weird about you yeah. or what's a little bit like, is your conversation just a little bit uh, out in left field? Is it not something somebody would typically be interested in? Are you, are you letting them talk too? Yeah. Are you asking them questions about themselves? And are you acting interested as well in what they're saying? And so it's the active listening and paying attention to body language. I would say if somebody's going on dates and they're not uh, producing anything further, it could just be, uh, yeah. there could be some pretty simple fixes. Well, I think too, guys are a little bit more direct and a little bit easier to read for other guys when it comes to whether or not we were having a good time or whatnot. Cause we'll tell you, man, dude, that sucked. Right. She's probably not going to say, yeah, I'm not that into you. Right. She's, she's going to ask nice and polite. The other thing too, that I think it's important for men to understand with respect to male, female relationships is that women are more vulnerable, um, in that situation. So w- women are, women are by nature more vulnerable to men because of, you know, again, the, the physical prowess uh, or the physical, um, differences between men and women, um, you know, sorry, Hollywood. And so I, I think it's important to understand that whereas a, a guy might be perfectly willing to tell you, you know, that they don't like something or they, or that sucks or that's stupid, or you're a moron, right? A woman's not going to do that. Um, so they're going to find more polite ways to yeah. kind of brush you off or ignore you or, or whatnot. And so it's, it's important to understand that if she's not actively engaged in the conversation and excited about what you're talking about, then that's probably a good indication that yeah. date didn't go as well as you thought. The other thing I would say is that I, I also think modern dating is, is <laughs> practice for divorce. I think that was how John Lovell yeah. put it once was modern dating is practice for divorce. And, <laughs> and really, really what it comes down to is the people that I see being the most successful, especially early on, are, are ones that know each other because there's some sort of shared interest within the environment that they're in. So again, oftentimes that's church. Sometimes it's school. Sometimes it's an occupation. That can also lead people to come to the conclusion that they like each other when in reality they just have a shared you know, interest. And so I, I think there's actually a lot of value into fostering, um, you know, a certain element of friendship before you're really going into the, Hey, we're dating. We're on this romantic pursuit right now. I, I get that that's not always possible and that's not always easy. Um, but you know, all, all I can say is from what I've seen, uh, the, the people that knew that they had shared interests or shared values is really the most important part. They had, they knew they had shared values. And then it was a question of maybe doing things in groups first. It wasn't just one-on-one. So there wasn't a lot of pressure to hold up an entire you know conversation or whatnot. They did stuff in, in groups. And then over time it was, okay, yeah, there's a genuine attraction here. Now we move on to the next level because you've already established, you've already established the shared values and certain shared interests before you go out on that first like date. And, and so now there's a much higher degree of probability that this, you guys are going to be, 
you know, suitable toward one another. Um, the other thing too, that I always tell people and everyone tells, I shouldn't say everyone, modern culture says I'm wrong on this and I'm not modern culture is wrong. Sorry. Um, if you front load the physical, you are setting yourself up for failure. Oh yeah. You are totally, this, this, again, this is why I hate that term. Like, well, how do you know if you're sexually compatible? Really? So, so let me get this straight. You spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually love someone like you guys are just totally vibing, absolutely love someone you're, you're together. And then as time grows, you have affection, then you have, you know, love, then you have like this passionate desire for one another, but you're not going to be able to figure out the physical part. Yeah, yeah, it assumes that that aspect will be perfect on the first day. Yeah. No. It, it's so, in fact, what, what ends up happening is when people front load the physical, because it's actually the easiest to satisfy on some level, especially for a dude, Right. What ends up happening is they ignore all the problems yeah. with the spiritual, emotional, and intellectual because, hey, I, I, I just want the dopamine hit. And so, you know, or whatever. So Although the point I, is, is that just point out the though? point is, is don't front load the physical. Like if, if you are, if you are really vibing with someone, all those other areas, I, I, you're going to take the time to figure out the physical compatibility within marriage. Well, so in 2023, I will say. Uh, you could get to the altar, get all the way to your honeymoon, and suddenly realize you've got duplicates of the parts, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that you are not sexually compatible. <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, make make at least sure, just make sure they are not. the actual opposite sex. I, I have right. a question. There's been a bit of a controversy brought up in the a chat about whether or not men should take advice from women when it comes to dating. And I want your opinion on this. Tina, I because, saw that in the chat. Because I, was I, address I think it. I think there are. It's a very different situation when you go to an unmarried woman for advice yeah. Yeah. versus someone like yourself who's been married and uh, has you know friendships with a lot of different people. What are your thoughts on that? Um, my my th okay. So I just just I understand why a guy in today's um, society wouldn't want to take advice from women because women a lot of times will tell you they want something and it's not what they want. I mean, yeah. it's, it is something, it is very strange. And, and women have a tendency to sort of back each other up and just be yeah. like, you go girl. And, and oh, it, nothing can possibly be wrong with women and all of this. But then also you get women that will placate you and be like, mm, well, you're just so wonderful. I, don't, I can't imagine why a girl would be off put by yeah. anything you would do. And what, but what I'm doing is I'm telling you, I will tell you the nitty gritty. I will tell you if you're a little weird, uh, a woman's going to be off put by that. And I'm going to tell you if you're acting a little weird yeah. because I care, like I care about people and I don't want them to be unsuccessful. And so, and I am a huge advocate for, look, <laughs> I had things I needed to change about myself in order to become a better, um, a sort of a better match or a better mate to my spouse. Nick had things he needed to change about himself. They're not like massive changes, but we we do slough off our rough edges for each other. We do work on becoming better communicators and things like that. And so when it comes to needing to change, I think people do need to change a lot, very often. And so this whole idea where it's like, oh, you shouldn't have to change a thing. You, they should love you just the way you are. That is a bunch of just, Bull crap. Yeah. So it, it, they shouldn't just love you the way you are. You should learn how to love them properly, learn how to love each other properly and how to communicate properly. And that requires change. So well, so what, what I'm taking from this is question the advice from seeing a woman women, and feminists. Yeah. And feminists. But heed the advice of married women. Well, well OK, can I, I, I'm just I'm not saying you should heed anything that I say. I'm just trying to give you an idea as to why what I'm saying might be a little different than what you're used to. I, I again, I think it goes back to the whole idea of if you if if you have a if you have a a married woman that you know that you're like you know all friends and stuff like that, and she's in a good, healthy, committed relationship where she's dedicated to her husband, and you're asking her advice, she's probably far more likely to one give you a very very honest opinion because there there's no there's no attraction there. There's no other issue there Two, Um, she, she's, if she's in the sort of relationship that you would like to have, then, then chances are she's going to give you much better advice than somebody that isn't in one of those relationships. Oh yeah. And, and so that's what it comes down to is it, it's more about kind of figuring out, um, 
figuring out what you want and then asking the people how they achieved it. But I'm totally sympathetic to why a guy in today's society would be really disillusioned with anything a woman has to say. I mean, guys are really just getting the raw end of the deal right now. All right, so we got we got we're gonna have a couple more uh, super chats here, and then we're gonna go into Tina's question for me. Um, the professor Keen, me and my fiance are planning to get married next year. So, do both of you have any advice or stories to help in my first time heading to the altar? Also, what is the tax situation for married couples here in Virginia? Tax situation isn't necessarily significant one way or another. Um, here's what I would say. I mean, my my big advice is that if if you guys are are committed, it's it's the shared values and the shared like fundamentals of worldview are really, really important. The other thing I would say is that, um, it's, it's really important when you're engaged. I, now I'm a big believer, even though this, you know, <laughs> my daughter's married right now and they have a long engagement. I'm a big believer in shorter engagements if, if possible, because I think there's a higher propensity to uh, allow the relationship to move into areas that, you know, again, I, I believe should be preserved for marriage. So it, it depending on how long your engagement is and whatnot, I, I would still try to, you know, honor, you know, the commitments that you have to one another as, as far as maybe not doing certain things that you shouldn't do before you get married. Um, the other thing too, that I would just say with the fiance again, what, what Tina and I did before we got married, but it was an ongoing conversa conversation. Uh, even though we got engaged and two months later we were married and, and I was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina and, and yeah, she we was planned in that California. wedding in six weeks. Um, if you haven't done this already, one of the biggest things that I would, I would say, and hopefully you've already had the conversation on the, those fundamental things that are very, very important. The biggest thing I would say is you need to start verbalizing expectations that you have for one another with respect to who's going to be, you know, the primary breadwinner. Are you both going to work? What happens when you start having kids? Does she want to be able to stay home? Okay. Well then now you're going to have to get, now you need to, you need to plan for the fact that you need to be able to survive on one income and not create a bunch of bills and whatnot. When she has kids, you need to start talking about what are the expectations with respect to cooking, with respect to cleaning, with respect to household responsibilities. Um, talk about all of those things. Um, not from the standpoint of, I mean, you, you need to be honest about kind of what your expectations are, but you also need to be willing to listen to another perspective and potentially, you know, shift some of those expectations or, or adjust, um, because one of the worst things that happens to people is they were, especially the ones that have loaded all the physical stuff first, is their relationship was really rooted in the the physical connection, having fun together, going out and going on dates, and now real li life starts together. And the real life is more fun. Can I just say that right off the bat? This is not something where, oh, this is all so exciting and now you get into the drudgery of living together. No, the living together is the fun part when you do it right. But you, you need to verbalize those, those expectations that you both have. So you guys can sync up and make sure that it actually makes sense. So that when you do start living that life together, um, you're, you're prepared for that. The other thing that you really guys really want to start to talk about is what, what is your process? And, and you've probably already done this to some degree, but what is your process for conflict resolution when you guys disagree on something? And we, we actually did a video um, on this a while back where Tina, I, I was talking about different rules that Tina and I have. And one of the biggest rules Tina established right off the bat is, look, we're going to disagree. You know, just remember you're talking to the woman that you love. Your, your goal here is not to try to destroy me in a debate. It's we're, we're trying to come to the conclusion together. So it was talk to the other person. Remember that when you have a disagreement with your spouse, you're talking to the person that you love. Two, facts matter. All right. That doesn't mean that emotions don't. It doesn't mean the perspective doesn't, but facts matter. And both of you have to be committed to that idea that, look, at the end of the day, I can understand how something might make you feel or how, you know, something might, you know, chalk up a memory or something like that. But facts matter and facts are facts. And then the, the third component of that is just always making sure that you guys understand that it is not about you winning the argument or her winning the argument. It's about at the end of it, you guys have come to a conclusion about something um, that is beneficial to the marriage because you're again, in, in, in our faith, once you get married, you're, you're, you're one now, right? You, you are, a, you are one unit. Obviously you're still two people, but you're one unit and, and you're trying to focus on what, what is best for that marriage because ultimately that's, what's going to be best for both of you as well. As long as you, again, start off with those good foundations have that mindset. Was there anything you wanted to add to that, babe, before we move on? Um, you know, I mainly get some good marriage counseling before you get married. Yeah. With people you trust. Yeah. How important is that? Really important. Critical. Because there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of things in people's past. We all have our bags packed for us by our parents, right? For life. You know, everything they taught us, everything they raised us with um, informs a lot of how we see relationship later on. And so 
it is good to unpack some of that stuff and examine it to see what you want to keep and what you want to toss and go, hey, my parents did this thing. I didn't really like how that worked out. Let's throw that out and not do that same thing they did. But let's also implement this other thing. You know, so whatever it is, you can come to an agreement with before any conflict ever happens with how you're going to approach conflict. And so I do think that marriage counseling is really important because you can go back and examine what what different relationships informed how you see relationship and that's going to uh, help you make a good plan going forward. All right, so we got two more here. Isaac Gorski, thank you for the super chat. My best advice is to stop the nice guy act, be a good man, and learn to dance. YouTube it or take a class. At a class, you'll likely find a girl too. I will say that I this is one of my biggest regrets is that I really don't know how to dance. Like I, I wish I did. It is pretty cool. Um, and again, we're going to get to the whole nice guy versus good man. And then Molly Nichols, thank you for the super chat. Please start Freitas matchmaking on Circle. So Circle that, is our community. That's commu- an idea right there. Circle I, is our community chat. We'll, we'll have I to. I have always had that like streak of matchmaker in me. Yeah. Oh my You're gosh. You're pretty good at it. Yeah. You're pretty good Remember, at it. Remember, we, we've set up a few people and they got married and they're still together. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. there's I, a few. I give you the credit. I give you the credit. Yeah. Better at that than me. All right. So your question for me, babe. The question for you is, why are men attracted to damsels in distress? But I I want to add to this question and not just say damsels in distress, but also, why are men attracted to high-maintenance women? Uh, Good question. So here's the deal, and this is... (laughs) This is a this is kind of a shot across the bow, because um, when I was in high school, I was um, I kind of had that that I, I look I wanted to be a hero man I wanted to be the knight in shining armor and um, a girl who's got all of her stuff together and is confident and whatnot she 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 don't need no knight <laughs> and, and so there was this idea of, Oh, I would, I would be the guy that would come in and rescue. And I would be the guy that would protect. And I would be. And so I, I think those were positive um, instincts, but what it, what it led to was basically getting, you know, jerked around, right? It, 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 um, it led to this idea of you, you weren't showing up to save the day so much as, as you were, you ended up attracted to situations um, and a lot of times what you find is, is there can be, you know, some pretty bad consequences to that. Would you say that, um, the whole hero complex for men and the, um, needing a good challenge to domesticate for women or yeah. like a, you know, attraction to a project for women too, they're basically two sides of the same coin. It's the masculine version of what what women are doing. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think so. It's, it's the whole idea of, um, because guys will say, Hey, they don't want a high maintenance woman or they don't want that. Um, it, it just depends. I mean, obviously physical attraction, um, physical, physical attraction always ranks higher with men than it does with women. Yeah. It's important to both, but it ranks higher with men. And so there's some things that they kind of in, endure as a result of that. But when, when a woman is good at making a man feel, um, you know, capable or strong or like her hero or whatnot, she can string along a guy for a long time uh, because we feel needed in that environment. And we, we do have, I I think, I mean, at least good men have a natural inclination to want to protect um, and provide for women. And so if a woman knows how to manipulate that correctly, well, then she can string along a good guy for a long time. Just like if a man knows how to string along a woman looking for a challenge or with daddy issues or whatnot, he can string her along a long time by making her feel special um, when he needs her. So it's it's a ripe situation for narcissism. Yes. But also, um, I can I bring this up real quick because Damon makes a really good point. He said those strong the women that claim to be strong, independent females are pretty much the worst. No, I think da- Damon <laughs> uh, wrote it in all well, caps, like everything else. <laughs> no, yeah, but he's yelling at all of he's us. He's yelling at all of um, us. No, so. He makes a really good point, though, because modern day strong, independent women, that's like a big flashing light for I have a whole crap ton of baggage you're going to have to deal with. Yeah, because they're lying to themselves about being strong, independent women half the time. Either that or they have shut down a side of themselves that is necessary for good relationship. Yeah. Uh, What's your opinion on that on modern day? 
it's it's not strong women that are the problem. It's the independent side where they yeah. think they don't need anybody else. They're going to do everything themselves and they're, everything is all about number one. When that's your mindset, you can't allow anybody else to come in and um, come alongside you and partner with you. And you also are so self-focused that you can't be what that person needs either. No, I, I, so I think that we put, we do place in, when we talk about things like individual liberty and individual responsibility and not being dependent, I think there's a difference between independent and not being dependent, right? You, you don't want to be so dependent, um, like on the government or on your parents or whatever it is to where, you know, it, it, again, at a, at the appropriate age where you, you're totally incapable of functioning apart from someone. That's not what you want. What, what should be taking place in a, in a positive relationship is, there, there's there's complementary skill sets, personality types, and things like that that make you better as a unit, and then you're able to function at a level that would be better. It's it's the whole idea of being better than the sum total of the, of the parts. So yeah, there's there's things that I do better than you. There's things that you do better than me. Um, but together, when we have an equal appreciation for what we bring to the table, and then we're, we're also committed to the idea that the marriage is, is what we want to be successful because of what that means for us, what it means for our kids, what it means for you know society in general. That's when all of a sudden you realize that, yeah, there's, there's a certain degree of interdependency within that thing, but it's not damaging. It's not counterproductive. And I think that the, the message that women have been fed is this, like, you need to be a strong, independent woman. Hey, what does that mean? If it means strong in the sense that you have a, a good, you know, um, command over your own emotions and intelligence and capability, sure. If it means independent in the sense that, uh, in, when necessary, you're able to um, act and take care of yourself independently or take care of, your, sure. But I think it's been translated more and more that no, you don't need a man. Yeah. And it's like, okay, what is it? What do you mean by that? Like, do I do I need a woman? Right. No, I want one. <laughs> I want my wife, right? And it's not bad for you to want a man or, or want your husband. Well, because we are each other's counterpart in various areas. And I know that when when there have been situations in our past where like panic could possibly set in, you know, some, yeah. something's urgent. Um, Nick is the absolute calm in those situations. And, and I'm usually the one hoping that I can like, be beneficial in some way, but I, I in no way, shape or form am as good at that side of things as Nick is. However, when Nick has not been there, when he was deployed or anything like that, and we had situations, I still was able to step up and, and deal with them. I still, I don't feel like I was as good at it, at it as him, but it wasn't something where, uh, um, like I see some women that are just like, I would never know how to do such a thing. Yeah. Like I just call people to do that. I don't know how I'm like, I, I don't have a lot of respect for that either. I, so to me, it's like, you should still be capable. A woman should be capable, not yeah. necessarily independent and so self-focused, but she should still be capable. I think, I think that's a really good distinction because if you look at most of your life and you look at the things that bring value to life and meaning and purpose, it's not found in, in independence. It's, it's actually found in relationships. Yeah. And, and, and now that's not to say that there aren't things that also provide purpose and meaning outside of, of relationship, but the vast majority, when, when you look back on your deathbed, what are you thinking about typically, you know, family, friends, um, and the experiences usually in conjunction with people that you cared about. Yeah. And so it's important to take that and, into consideration. And just because you do find somebody and you do end up getting married and, and the whole deal, like we, there's a lot of folks in the chat that have had first marriages that didn't pan out the way they wanted them to. Um, and, and a lot of times people will look at us and go, oh, well, you know, lucky for you, lucky for you that you found this thing. And oh it's like, gosh, I don't like that. And the reason I don't like that is because marriage takes work. It really does. You work to get the person, you work to maintain that relationship and you work to continue to grow as a couple. And the minute that work diminishes and you stop working on it, mm -hmm. that's when you failed. It, the marriage doesn't even have to end. Yeah for you to have failed in the marriage. And that is when you no longer feel the need to um, uphold the other person anymore. When you no longer feel like you need to provide or, or do your portion for each other and that you're not willing to pour out love to them anymore, that's, that's when it fails. Yeah. We got a super chat here and then we're going to move on to our final segment. Justin Henley, thank you for the super chat. Modern, modern, modern. 
Modernity teaches women to be independent for years of their lives. Then they try to go against independence to marry and start a family nonsensical. No, I, I think that's right. Again, I, I think I think what's happening in some sense, and this is an important thing to understand because this is not conspiratorial. It's just a it's a competing worldview. So the competing worldview, especially rooted in in critical theory, postmodernism, this whole idea where it puts all the emphasis on oppressor and oppressed has labeled marriage and specifically institutions with a husband and a wife, they've, they've put them into this quasi category of patriarchal and put them in the, in, in, in a negative uh, sense and, and acted like they are the enemy of a woman's freedom. And, and the end result is that the women that have actually tried to apply that in their life find out that it, it typically doesn't make them happy. And so the, the question then becomes, uh, is there any sort of introspection or looking back on, on the actual worldview that created this, this vision or imagery of marriage? And a, a lot of times the answer is no. Like the, the response from the progressive side of this or the, the critical theory side of this is you've just embraced the patriarchy or you've just embraced the oppression as opposed to you know changing the world and society into the utopia that we could all have, we could just throw out all these social norms and replace them with the ones that we're now giving you. Well, again, I, I would I would say that it's not like these ideas haven't been, you know, haven't been tried. They have been. The problem is that whenever they fail, we always get the idea of well, that wasn't. You know, it's the it's the coincidence that wasn't real socialism, right? That wasn't real strong independent, you know, female, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's always some excuse for why the ideas fail, and it's usually blaming. Um, the, the culture that came before, the ideas that came before. And so when we look at the, the traditional ideas of this, um, I, I think they work. That is that is not to say that there aren't negative manifestations of them. And, and this, we get into this with the whole like toxic masculinity or toxic femininity or toxic this or toxic that. More often than not than what we find when we look at traditional approaches to something or we look at concepts of masculinity or femininity, what we find is a predisposition towards certain responses, attitudes, capabilities, and there's positive manifestations of them and there's negative manifestations of them. And what I've seen a lot within the whole critical theory push is the idea that no, masculinity is toxic and these traits are made up of it. And in order for women to be truly free, we have to diminish these, this, this idea of masculinity. And whenever we point out that, okay, yeah, you say that until there's a war or you say that until, you know, you need someone to step in. Well, we're not talking about that bull crap. You were talking about it five seconds ago. And then when we bring up obvious contradictions within your worldview, you want to pretend that you were just talking about this narrow thing over here rather than this, this broader concept. And, and I don't buy it anymore. I don't, and I think a lot of people aren't buying it anymore. And you're starting to see this, this rebellion, this pushback, which I think is really positive. And, it, and it's rooted in this idea that, look, no one is here sitting pretending that every marriage which claims to be traditional or every view which claims to be traditional is therefore accurate and, and good or completely devoid of negative manifestations. But the idea is whether or not it speaks to the appropriate fundamentals. There's all kinds of negative applications of good fundamentals. All right? So... That's really what we're talking about here, and I, and I think you're right. Modernity has attempted to overthrow a lot of traditional concepts and replace them with ones rooted in critical theory, which is inherently Marxist. And that's why we say Marxism is not just an economic theory. It really is more of a comprehensive world. It is a far more comprehensive worldview than people, I think, give it credit for. Um, it's and, seeking and, to drive a wedge between the sexes. Yeah. It's, it's making... Um, being able to have healthy, um, meaningful relationship with the opposite sex more and more elusive. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's go to this last one. All right. So nice guys versus good men. And I put this specifically in the dating stage because there are things that kind of change within the nature of relationships. And, and this episode is largely more around this whole idea of, you know, why do nice guys finish last? And I, I'm going to list out some things that I kind of associate with this whole nice guy culture versus good men culture. And my standpoint is nice guys finish last because they kind of got it coming. Hmm. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, you're going to have to explain that. I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to explain this based off of what I mean by a nice guy. Right. Okay. Cause obviously different okay. people can have different viewpoints. All right. So let me give some examples here. What I have is like 15 examples. All right. So nice guys listen, right. They're very, very good listeners, but they don't, they never assert themselves. They just kind of agree, right. Good men listen, but they don't get walked on. Which is to say that if a when a good man is having a discussion with a, a girl that he likes or whatnot or is interested in they're dating or whatever it is, a good man will will listen to what she has to say and will attempt to understand her perspective. 
but he doesn't surrender on the notion that there is such a thing as right and wrong. There is such a thing as facts. There is such a thing as your perspective on those facts matters, right? The, the emotional component that you bring to those facts and that perspective matters, but it doesn't trump the nature of facts. And so a good man does not say, I have to give up on the truth in order to make you feel better about you know, your reality or your truth or whatnot. Whereas a nice guy is just like, oh gosh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's your, that's your perspective. That's your truth. I need to understand that. I need to respect that. No, there's the truth. Heck and and I, well, and I, and I need to be, I need to be respectful of your perspective on it and have a discussion with you. But, but a nice guy gives up on the truth in order to make her feel better. Yeah. A good man insists on the truth so that they can both be better after the end of the conversation. That's a good way to put it. Is that fair? I agree. Okay, next one. Nice guys are there for you no matter what. Now, again, I'm talking about dating. Nice guys are there for you no matter what. Good men don't waste their time with unreasonable people. Oh, yeah. And I would add to that particular one is good men spot red flags early. Mm -hmm. And that's why good men won't won't go for certain women. Yeah. And, and so if you really want to be the sort of guy that attracts a good woman, you need to spot the red flags in women. Yeah. Uh, and, and not ignore them just cause she's pretty or not ignore them just cause she, you know, well, and don't get physical too early guys fall into this all the time. They, they, oh man, man, that girl's hot. They start, it gets physical quick. And then all of a sudden all the red flags that typically would be showing up on their radar are out the window because they're just thinking about, I, I wonder when, I wonder when she's going to get naked again. And there's <laughs> a red flag for you right there. Probably yeah. on her next Instagram post. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the thing is, that's another thing you can do is it's like, if you're going after these girls and you see Instagram posts and she's showing you lots and lots of cleavage all the time and her butt's angled at the camera and it's just all different angles of her, like looking over her shoulder with her butt sticking out at you, <laughs> you guys, come on. Yeah. Of course, you're gonna get friend zoned by this girl. Well, that's the 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 the, the, the focus is nice she's guys. Trash. Nice guys are there for you no matter what. Good yeah. guy. This isn't. Now I will say this: once you're married, you do have an obligation to be there for your family, like, no matter what. Yeah, no matter what. But when you're dating, when you're first identifying whether or not this is someone that you want to make, that sort of lifelong commitment where you will have to be there for him no matter what. Yeah, you you want to do some of the research up front, and if yeah. she is totally unreasonable, dude, walk away. I don't care how hot she is. Yeah. Right. All right. I mean, now, it's what, crazy what hot if? matrix, guys. Just <laughs> Tina, implement the crazy hot matrix. Tina, what if? Yeah. You date a girl, she has those types of photos on her Instagram, you ask her to take them down, she takes them down, is that a green flag? Or uh, should you have just okay. not started at all? You probably shouldn't have started at all. However, it really depends on how that went, how that conversation went down. If you asked her to put take them down and she just did it, um, you didn't get to the bottom of why she felt she needed those up there to begin with. Ooh, yeah. And so you need to do the work it takes to find out why this girl feels like she needs to show that stuff. Like, why is she marketing this? Well, and, so, and, 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 this and, is, and is it to get a guy? And so then what does that say about you if you're the guy that went for it? So there, there, there there's is a, a lot to think about there. I, I also think this is a part where fathers play an incredibly important role in their daughter's lives. And here's what I mean by that. Women, as soon as women start to develop, right, they start to recognize that they all of a sudden have this really strange power over boys that they didn't have before. And it is very alluring. It's very, it, it's got to be tempting. Can you, can you imagine, yeah. guys, I want you to imagine something Girls for a second. Girls love to feel pretty and they love to feel like they can get whatever guy. I want, they I want, do <laughs> like to feel like they could get him. Yeah. Even if she doesn't want him, she's got, she likes the, the, the play of being able to tug a little bit and know that she's got him on the chain. Here's here's what I want. Here's what I want guys to understand. All right. So obviously when women start to develop breasts, right? That's something the that guys notice very quickly in, you know, high school and, and whatnot. I want you to imagine that if the way it worked for guys is that once we hit a certain age, all of a sudden our biceps just got like significantly bigger. And we were just like, oh man, I'm all all of a sudden I'm jacked. And, and, and women were like, oh my gosh, what happened? Like, and it was a relatively short period of time with, with no real effort on your part. It just kind of happened. And, and women were instantly physically attracted to you. But that would be a pretty tempting power to use for evil, right? So like understand, and this is where fathers come in, understand that when your daughters are, are going through this, this stage where now all of a sudden it, it's gone from, they're becoming young women, right? They're going to recognize at some point, uh, oh, wow guys are paying a lot of attention to me and that can be 
again, obviously that is a, a temptation to be able to use that power to get attention or to get validation or whatnot. So if you're not providing an environment where your daughters feel very, very safe and secure in an environment where they, they understand the difference between someone truly valuing them and someone just, you know, lusting after them, right? Like if, if they don't understand that, or if they, if they haven't been treated to that and understand that you're kind of setting them up for success or excuse me, for failure, so it's just an important thing. All right, next one. Nice guys focus on communication for conflict uh, resolution. Good men do too, but not because they have to. All right, so here's what I mean by that. Obviously, being able to talk something down and to de-escalate a situation could be important. But the, the nice guy does it because they have to. They're desperate. If they're not able to get themselves out of a situation. Oh, because they're wheeling and dealing. They're wheeling and dealing or they're like you know, Oh, Hey, Hey buddy. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm so, I'm so sorry. My bad. Right. Versus the guy that's like, Hey, right. It's cool. But no, a, ma a good man, a good man. If all of a sudden the conversation goes South, the good man is able to step up to defend, to fight, to do everything that they have to. Now, again, they will still try to be mature about a situation where it's like, look, we're not trying to look for a fight. We're not trying to do any of that. But there's certain lines you don't cross because a good man will show you what a bad idea it was for you to do that. Whereas a nice guy, just has to sit there and, and basically tuck his tail between his legs and figure a way to talk himself out of a situation. You're basically saying nice guys tend to be betas. Yes. Um, and so <laughs> if, a, if a stronger person is there, he will try to talk himself out of the situation. Whereas a good guy, um, it, it's, it's like he could, he could get himself out of the situation physically if necessary, but doesn't find it necessary all the time. Yeah. Ben says, Nick, you have parents these days dressing their kids provocatively. That's yeah, you're true. right. And they are setting their kids up for failure. I, I have, I have seen kids where like I've had to drop my kids off a, a dance or something like that, where it's like, holy crap, did what, where was the dad, you know, when somebody showed up to that dance, it's like, well, you just, you just put your teenage daughter out there in an environment where, you're inviting boys to look at her as nothing more than an object of lust. I can't believe it. And every just, si every believe single it. time homecoming comes around or whatever semi formals come around and I'm looking at some of these dresses hanging off of these girls, barely covering up oh their God. crotch. Yeah. I'm just going, and you bought this for your daughter. Yeah. I can't believe you bought this for, and you're taking pictures and you're posting it all over the internet and you're like, Oh, doesn't she look beautiful? I'm like, she looks like she's about to go down Hollywood Boulevard <laughs> looking for, for monetary dates. <laughs> <laughs> she looks like she's auditioning for only fans. <laughs> yeah. Jack D said, Nick should stop talking about dating. He grew up before internet dating was a thing. Now you did grow up before internet dating was a thing, but I don't think the principles, the principles are the same. Looking they for are applied in the, the same, same way. Look, if, if, yeah. you, if telling yeah. somebody they can't talk about it because they didn't No, there's an yeah. old fashioned way to do this. And we're trying to tell you yeah. to get back to the old fashioned way of doing this. Yeah, is what it is. Um, all right. Nice guys. Think of ways to show you that they're thinking of you. This one's a little bit more to, nice guys. Think of a way. Uh, nice guys. <laughs> think of ways to show you they are thinking of you. Good men make a woman feel appreciated and desired. So I want to be careful on this one. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to make a woman, to let a woman know that you're thinking of her, but I do think there's, I do think there's a all, difference. All those but, freaking good morning text. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do think, I think there's a way where you, you will get like the nice guy that's like, Hey, thinking of you, Hey, think where it's almost like text stalking or oh, whatever it annoying. is yeah. versus a, a guy versus a man who may out of the blue do something that he knows um, you like. Um, so he still lets you know that he's thinking of you, but the way he does it makes you feel generally appreciated and desired. So you don't think that good men text their girlfriend every morning with a good morning text? I don't. Okay, so Nick is not a good person to talk to about <laughs> being responsive on text. No, uh, because he true. is he is the I, least. I, th I think it's kind of silly to be honest with you. Um, I think if you've established that as a dynamic, some people see some of these things like Snapchat streaks and stuff like that, and they'll show how long the streak is. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's certain things if you implement it early on that once you stop, it's like, what happened? Yeah. Uh, but if you didn't start it to begin with, then you're pretty safe. But so, so here's a good rule of thumb, just to give you an idea. Uh, cause when my parents were starting off one of their businesses, they hired a consultant to talk to them about good business practices. And one of the 
things they took away from it was don't ever start something that you can't continue indefinitely. And the reason why is because as soon as you stop doing that thing, their quality of service has now just degraded. And so like, let's say they walk into your shop and you take their coat and you put it on the coat hanger when they come in and when you, when you first start, and that's just something you do when you first start, but then your business starts doing really, really well and and you get really busy and now you can't do that for everybody anymore. So you stop doing that. Well, now these people come in and they're like, well, they used to take my coat yeah. and now they don't. You guys changed. Yeah. And and the quality of service just isn't as good as it used to be. And then they write a Yelp review. So yeah. that's the thing is in relationship, it's kind of the same way. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into it. Don't give yourself extra work. Yeah. Well, and the other thing too is again, the, the nice guy, the nice guy can't distinguish between almost like constantly keeping tabs or constantly doing things. It's a little stalker versus versus the good man, which when he engages or when he does something special, she feels genuinely appreciated or desired or both. I think because both I don't think a woman wants to feel like a guy is sitting there like obsessing about her. Yes. Um, yes. It's like contact me when you've got something to actually say. Yeah. All right, here we go. Um, nice guys seek out damsels in distress. Right, because that's something they can repair and make that makes them feel like wanted or needed. Good men appreciate strong women, and by strong women, again, I didn't say strong independent women. I said strong women in the sense that women who know what they want, know what they're about, um, but who also, again, one of the things I really appreciate about Tina is that I, I had to go to war for like nine months at a time. Yeah, right. I couldn't sit there and and do everything. She had to run everything by herself with three kids. Right. And, and I always, and I felt confident that she would be able to do that and do it effectively. Now, when I would get home, she would, she would immediately make me feel, um, appreciated, desired. Cause this is a, it's a two way thing, but it was the idea like she was glad that I was home and that I was there now to, again, I could protect her. I could help her and stuff like that. But it wasn't one of those, well, look what I've been doing for the last nine months while you've been off, you know, having fun in Iraq. It was, it was, I'm so glad you're home mm-hmm. and the kids are so glad to see you and you know, everything else. So that's the part where I'm saying a strong woman is that my, my presence to, you know, fix things or to do things or whatnot, yeah. that wasn't needed for us to survive as a, as a married couple. One of the, one of the points of being, I think strong is I'll, I'll explain it this way. When Nick would call, it would be hardly ever when he was deployed. Um, if he could get on a satellite phone to, to call, get a call out, it was extremely rare. When we were on the call, I tried to make sure he knew that we all loved and missed him. And I, I tried to, encourage him in what he was doing and not weigh him down with all the mundane things that I was having to face every five minutes. Like, Oh, the kids were crying and I can't do, you know, this was happening and, and blah things that he can't do anything about. If he can't do anything about it, why would I burden his mind with it right now? in the tiny little time that we have to talk Instead, I wanted to use that time to encourage him in, in, to go out and continue the job he was doing. And so in my mind, like Damon, when we were talking about strong women, in my mind, that is a strong woman, a woman yeah. who can take on those challenges and not burden somebody else with it. Um, and she has the awareness to be able to um, recognize that that she doesn't need to boo-hoo all over yeah. everybody all the time. Well, when, when I when I was away, Tina stepped up in order to accomplish roles that would traditionally have been played by me. But when I got home, she would go back into the position of allowing me to, to do the roles that I was doing. And so we, we I mean, again, there was a very strong respect and, and, and appreciation for that from, you know, my perspective. Um, okay, nice guys avoid conflict. Good men care enough to get to the bottom of the issue. And, yeah. and here's what I mean by that. Just I mean, tell her she's right. Yeah. The, 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 right. the nice guy, the nice yeah. guy doesn't want to, the nice guy doesn't want to have the conversation about the thing that could cause her to leave or not pay attention or to get angry. The good man recognizes that if this is someone you're going to potentially spend the last of your life with, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be issues and you need to find ways to actually get through them. And so the good, the good man recognizes right off the bat, Hey, we need to, if this is something that's a problem, we need to get to the bottom of it because it isn't, it isn't good for us to, it, 
unresolved conflict leads to bitterness and resentment. Yeah, you don't want it festering under the surface. Yeah, and so, so you have to be able to confront hard things together and not just yield and go, oh well, I'm just gonna happy wife, happy life. Yeah, that's no. crap. If you're no. doing that in your dating life, do not marry that woman. No, and and don't and by the way. This is twofold because if, if a woman behaves that way, it's like nothing, I'm fine, you know, whatever. Look, there, there's a little bit of that where a woman doesn't want to have to constantly tell you what she needs. She wants you to be observant enough to be able to understand it on some level. But there's a there's a reasonable quotient here, right? So there's the there's there's a woman saying that, yeah, you should understand that you don't do stupid things or that you should pick up on what somebody likes over time to be able to you know appreciate them and show that you care. And then there's other things where it's totally unreasonable for you to assume that I would know what's bothering you right now. If I've been gone all day working and I come home and you're upset, there's no reasonable why I would know why you're upset. If it's like nothing, no. And, and, and a good man in that moment will say, look, I can see that something's wrong. And if there's something I can do about it, I want to, cause I care about you, but you're going to need to tell me what it is. If she's wanting to say, well, this is what's going on and talk with you about it, especially if it's something with you. Great. If she's not, then at some point that should signify a big red flag to you that this is, this is someone that wants to play games or it's someone that cannot effectively communicate and we're either going to figure this out or we're not. But the way it's not going to be figured out is by saying, oh, well, you know, the, the dating equivalent of happy wife, happy life, right? Oh, well, happy girl. I just don't want to upset her. I, she's going to blow up or she's going to be this. She's going to, so I don't want to do it. So I'm just going to, no, no, yeah. no. And on the other side of this, women, we all need that friend that is going to give, a, give us a sanity check. There are times when maybe I'm hormonal or whatever, and I can just kind of go, hmm, I kind of can't even stand myself right now. You know, <laughs> like maybe I'm being unreasonable and I feel like a lot of women don't ask themselves that question. Am I being unreasonable? Yeah. And and I don't know why. And and maybe they'll kind of, kind of come back like, mm, maybe I'm being unreasonable. No, I'm not. I'm just a wonderful you woman. You go, girl. You go, and, slay queen. Yeah. And then they get their <laughs> friends all around them to like boost their ego and talk about why he's bad and he's just totally wrong and blah, blah, blah. You need a friend that won't do that to you because – that friend is trying to avoid an uncomfortable conversation where she has to tell you you're kind of bat crap crazy right now. <laughs> and you need a friend that's willing to tell you, that is a good enough friend that's willing to tell you you're being a little crazy. Well, Patrick and, and, and then what do you do with it once you are being a little crazy? Recognize you're being a little crazy and change it. Yeah. Like fix it. Pa Patrick Bet David talked about this a little bit on Valuetainment where he was talking about with he getting into conflict with his wife and uh, this is like early on in their marriage. And she would go talk to, you know, her five friends. And he finally said, who are the five people you talk to? Right? Who are the five people you talk to when you have an issue with me? And what do they say? And what the conclusion they came to is they all validated whatever her concerns or problems or anger was. And the five people he talked to all told him, oh, don't be a dumbass, right? Like, look, man, she's the best thing that ever happened to you. Like, you know, hey, get your crap. I understand. He goes, you can't make the five people, like, you, you have to pick the five people that you talk to, people that want us to succeed. And again, he's not talking about like an abusive relationship or something like that, where somebody's going to say, oh, go back no matter how bad the beat. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about when you have the, the, the disagreements that tend to take place within a marriage, are you talking to people that want your marriage to succeed? Or are you talking to people that are just going to validate whatever you want to hear? Or are they just on team Nick or yeah. team Tina? It's, there is no team Nick. There is no team Tina. No. It, is, it is team us. Yeah. And if you have friends that are just on one team, that's problematic. Yeah. Don't talk to them about your relationship if they're only on one team. Yeah. Only if you're going to talk about your relationship and and which I'm not a huge fan of going and boohooing to people about mm -hmm. whatever little disagreement you had yesterday. But if you really need to talk to somebody, make sure you're talking to somebody who has both of you in mind and loves you both. Yeah. For sure. All right. Nice guys accept, this kind of goes with the whole avoid conflict. Nice guys accept blame no matter what. Good men admit when they're wrong. Now, this is something where, um, again, I, I did a video I on mean, this once. I mean, it's only happened once or twice for, for you. Yeah. <laughs> accepting blame is different than accepting responsibility, right? Well, not, I mean, no, really. you, you could be wrong. Like, like accepting that, like, if you get blamed for doing something that you did, then you accept the blame and, and you accept responsibility to fix it right. and respect, accept responsibility for what you did. So it might be a, it might be a nicer term to use, but I, I don't want to, 
I, I don't want to go to the idea that, well, you shouldn't blame someone. Were they wrong? Well, we <laughs> are, are in a blame culture, though. Like right now, everybody wants to find out who's to blame for what. Well, and so, But here's is, what I'll say. It's nice guys accept blame no matter what, right? They just, they just, I see. they've I been see. kind of taught to just accept oh, it's my that fault. if something's wrong, yeah. well, then what did they do wrong? What could they have done better? What, what could I have done better? To, and look, there's always something to be said for introspection. Yeah, because I agree with that right there. Th there's it's, always some. There's something to be said for introspection, which is to say, could I have handled this better? Yeah. That's very different from assuming, you know, all the responsibility for a problem or an issue. Yeah. And that's why I say good men admit when they're wrong. Like we've, we've had situations before where I've had to go back to Tina and be like, I was wrong and you were, and that's the other part yeah, too. Like once or twice. A good man, <laughs> a good man doesn't just say like acknowledge to themselves that they were wrong. You got to go up to the person that you were wrong to and be like, I was wrong. You were right. I apologize. I'm going to fix it. Yeah. Or, and or sometimes I'm, you just completely misunderstand each other and you're both wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice guys believe in a 50-50. Oh, here we go. Ready to, ready to make some people mad? Yeah. Nice guys believe in a 50-50 relationship. Good men lead their families. So again, this kind of goes beyond the whole dating side into what does it mean to be a man? And I'm going to tell you right now, um, if you're if you are looking to be a man in a relationship, you better be willing to lead your family. If you think that this is the 50-50 means something with respect to the value of the human beings involved. I'm not more valuable than Tina. Tina's not more valuable than me, right? Um, and when we are both necessary for our marriage to reach optimal status. Okay, but I do have a leadership role to play. And and if you are if you are dating someone that doesn't believe that the man needs to play a leadership role, I'm going to tell you right now. I think you're going to have problems. And the way I expressed this to somebody once who wasn't necessarily keen on this, I said, if if you believe marriage is for life, better or for worse, sickness and health, then at some point there's going to come a time where you don't agree on something. Who's responsible for making the decision at that point? So people have this idea in their mind that leadership is I'm the boss. No, this is at least in, in our yeah, faith. You're not a tyrant. In our faith, what it is, is I have responsibilities associated with servant leadership, which is to say that my role as a leader within our marriage and within our family is I have to put her well being and our children's well being above my well being. And what that means in our faith is up to up to and including my life for theirs. If we're ever in a situation where one of us has got to run into the burning building, it's me. Right. If we ever got to get a situation where one of us doesn't get the life raft, it's me. That's the sort of leadership I'm talking about. And I, and I believe that that is a, that is a role that men have to adopt and assume, not just because it's their responsibility, because it's actually better for their marriages and their families. And, and I think that, uh, women feel safe in that situation. And I know like safety is very, very important to women. It's one of the reasons why they want to be strong, independent women and, and, deal with their provide for themselves and provide for their own safety and things like that is because safety is so important. If the man can provide that and it's, it's a truly safe environment, not just physically safe, but emotionally safe, mentally safe. Like, you know, you are in the hands of somebody who loves you and puts you before them. That is safety. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of freedom that comes in that, um, that you will reap the benefits of in a lot of different areas of your marriage. I'll just say yeah. Do you think it's more accurate to say that it's 100-100 rather than 50-50? Gosh, I, I hate all that stuff on there. I, I think what it is is I, I don't I don't know that there's a proper numerical. I, I don't think that the numbers is the proper way to look at it. I think when you look at it, and the, the value that she brings, I think, is equal to the value that I bring, but it is different. And so you, you embrace the difference because the difference is what actually gives you compatibility. Well, and we're, we're both in this, we're not reserving anything. So the idea of 50, 50 is almost like you're reserving 50%. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, we're not reserving anything. We're both yeah. all in. Yeah. And I feel like you have to both be all in. We burn the ships. There's no way out. <laughs> we're all in this works or it doesn't. I'd rather it works. So let's do the work to make it work. Yeah. All right. Nice guys make you feel safe around them. Good men make you feel safe anywhere. Thoughts. Oh uh, yeah. Um, so say it one more time. Nice guys. G nice guys make you feel safe around them. Good men make you feel safe anywhere. <laughs> here's here's what I mean by that. Um, you will see, 
and a lot and maybe I should maybe I should also say Yeah, that doesn't really fit for me. I I, I don't think, think that I think it's the uh, emotional. women feel that safe around nice guys because nice guys tend to be more uh betas. Think about what I'm talking about. A woman don't feels Don't be so nuanced. Get a it woman out. feels safe around a nice guy because they don't pose any threat to them okay. or anybody else. Or anybody. A good else. man okay. makes you feel safe anywhere you're at with them because they don't pose a threat to you but they can pose a threat to anybody else. Okay. That makes better sense. Yeah. Um, it's the same reason why women sometimes will go for that bad guy because he shows himself to be strong in a civilized yeah. society, right? Yeah. Be bucks the system or whatever. And he's strong enough to do that kind of stuff. Well, in a good man, he's also strong. Um, but he, he puts it to use in a different way. How about, how about this? Nice guys are unthreatening to women. Good men are pose a threat to anybody that would be a harmful to their woman. Sure. And, sure. I, and I use the possessive there. So somebody's going to get mad at me, but it's, it's the whole idea that no, a, a good, a good man is a threat is dangerous. Just not to you. Yeah. But ultimately like some of this too is the whole like nice guys finishing last or good guys finishing last. Ugh. There's so much more to this than just this. It's like, I, I have a hard, I have a little bit of a hard time with the way some of this is being couched only, only because, um, I, I feel like a lot of guys, there are a lot of good guys that they're making one mistake and they're going after the wrong women. And that's why yeah. they're finishing last. But if we're, but if we're just comparing, oh, this is the nice guy that's been, you know, uh, watered down and emasculated by this by feminism, then okay, I, I get what you're saying then. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go down to this one. Nice guys are threatened by other guys. Good men are confident um, that their woman is loyal to them. And and here's what I mean by that. Um, I don't mean I don't mean loyal in the sense that because um, loyalty is not just manifested in um, your 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 girlfriend not cheating on you. Right. Just like loyalty for men is not manifested in a man just not cheating on you. It's not just infidelity with respect to a relationship. Um, a, a nice guy is feels constantly threatened and jealous um, with respect to a woman. A, a, a good man um, is confident in her loyalty to him. So, so let me let me give you, for instance, if you go if you go out with the girls, I don't need you texting me every five minutes about where you are, not simply because I, I, I trust you, but because I know you well enough to know that you don't put yourselves in, you don't put yourself in situations where it, it would be, it would cause me concern or worry. Yeah. I, but I also think that, that, that right there also stems from who you chose. Well, that, all of this it, is it that. has, it has a lot to do with the guy and how he handles things. But if you chose somebody that would do that kind of oh, thing, I see what you're saying. Yeah. um, then, then it doesn't matter if you're a good guy who trusts someone she's still going to do what she's hardwired to do because you chose her. Yeah. You chose the girl that's on Instagram showing her butt all over the place. So what, so I, what I'm gathering from this is part of being a strong man is choosing the right woman because the right you woman allows you to serve that role. Recognize the red flags, recognize the green flags. And like, you got to choose somebody that isn't these other things. And if she is, and you realize it and, and before things, you know, before you're married, run, run. You're not going to fix it. Yeah. You're not. Just like she's not going to fix the bad guy. Yeah. You're not going to fix the bad girl. And no. it's just not going to happen. You can't save her. She's going to have to run her course and like find her third virginity somewhere with like some <laughs> guy that, yeah, some guy that is on his like fifth divorce. Well, look, look here, here's the other thing I will say. Here's the other thing I will say, because I, I, I am also a big, I, I'm a big believer in trying to do things as right as possible up front. And I certainly don't claim that I've made every single right decision in my life. I haven't. There's tons of things I can go back. I, I love it when somebody says, I have no regrets. I'm like, what are you, a moron? <laughs> like, did you, you did nothing wrong? <laughs> you did nothing you wish you would have done better? Um, I'm not talking about regret in the sense that you just like brood over it all the time. But I think everyone can recognize that, yeah, I, there's certain areas I could have made better decisions. Decisions. And a lot of what we talk about has to do with having, you know, some lived experience within these areas and now watching as some of those values that we transferred over to our kids are playing out and, and helping them make decisions that were even better than the decisions we made when they were their age. Yeah. And that's, that's really encouraging to see. By the same token, I'm also a big believer in redemption. 
but the whole idea of, of redemption is about understanding what screwed things up in the first place. Um, one of the most frustrating things I see, one, one of the most frustrating things I see coming out of parents' mouths when it comes to, you know, their kids are now going through this stage of, of dating and identifying things and how do you set your kids up for success to maybe to avoid some of the pain that you experience. We, we will talk about rules that we've set in place with, for our kids and, and we will have people say, oh, well, was that a rule when you were growing up? No. Well, does that make you hypocritical? No, it makes me not an idiot. Like I, I know what, I know what happened wrong and I'm now I'm using that knowledge in order to prevent other mistakes. And again, like I've said before, I, I'm fine with my kids getting bruises. I'm trying to avoid them getting scars, right? It's not that we shelter our kids so much that they can't go out there and, and make mistakes and learn and whatnot. But yeah, I'm trying to shelter them from things that are going to actually have lifelong consequences for their actions because they're not in an age appropriate enough to be able to understand the nature of those consequences or what causes them. And so we, we utilize the, that understanding and those successes and those mistakes in order to set, you know, our own children up for success. Yeah. There is no, nothing in the rule book that says that you need to repeat the mistakes your parents made. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Or you made. And, and that's, that's one, <laughs> I, I once put it this way. Like, I'm not trying to make my kids the best version of me. I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to set my kids up for success to be the best version of what God has intended for them to be. Right. And, and some of that is, is utilizing, you know, your, your own mistakes or your own experiences to say, yeah, hey, I did this. I would have done this differently. This is why. And explaining that. So when we go through this whole idea of like, okay, how does a guy, you know, why do nice guys finish last? Well, again, we've given you this, the version of nice guy we're talking about is not a guy that's just kind or has, you know, a high EQ or whatnot, or, or understands there's well. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the nice guy that uh, essentially is so docile and so uncertain of the themselves and so needy that, yeah, they don't pose any threat to a woman necessarily, right? They're, they're not, they're not necessarily a, a source of physical or emotional or mental abuse, but they also don't have anything appealing to a woman. And so a woman that identifies somebody that meets all those traits where it's like, okay, you're, you're, you're nice, you're friendly, but there's nothing about you that actually invokes a sense of the ability to protect, provide, or it invokes any sense of passion. Well, if you're that guy, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't be surprised when a woman doesn't want you because regardless of what modernity has told women and what regardless of what modernity is increasingly telling men, women want strong men. And, and to, to a point that Brian Betts brought up on this strong doesn't mean I'm constantly puffing out my chest and showing what a danger I am to the world. And, and it, no, it, it's, it's subtle, but it's there. And, and some of the things we talked about were again, good men listen, but they don't get walked all over. Right? Good men don't waste their time with unreasonable people. Good men um, can, will use communication to try to resolve you know, a, a situation and de-escalate a potentially violent situation. But if violence is, is required, they are fully capable of meting it out when needed in, in the protection of, of someone or something that they love. Good men make a woman feel appreciated and desired. Right? It's, not, it's not about texting every five seconds or, or basically using her to fill your validation. Um, you're, you're really thinking about it in a way that make her feel again, appreciated and desired. Uh, good men appreciate strong women. And again, when we talk about strong women, we're talking about capable women. We're not talking about this modern version of strong and independent. And I don't need no man. It's more of, no, we, we, we appreciate a, an emotionally stable woman who can step up, but also a woman who also appreciates our ability and our desire to provide and protect. Like she, she doesn't find that as a, as a insult or a threat to her own independence or strength. She actually recognizes the full potential of her own strength and also recognizing and appreciating ours. And we do the same, right? Good men care enough to get the bottom of an issue, right? If, if you're the sort of guy that just says, you know, well, I, I don't want to make my girlfriend mad because she's going to lose her mind. Well, if that's the case, one of two things is happening. Either you don't have the guts to actually step up and figure out what the deal is and actually show a little interest into what's bothering her. Or two, she's crazy. And in either one of those cases, you're either not mature enough to be in a relationship or she's crazy and you shouldn't be in a relationship, right? So a good man gets to the bottom of stuff and he, and he listens and he's willing to understand and he's willing to communicate and he's willing to admit that he's wrong, right? That's the other part in here. Good men um, are willing to admit, their, uh, admit when they're wrong and actually fess up to it and verbalize it. I was wrong. You were right. I apologize. I won't do that again. Or I'm going to improve on that or I'm going to fix that or whatever it is. 
right? But, but verbalizing that adds an incredible degree of validation. And one of the reasons why I think it's so important for men to be willing to do that and do that in a way that is genuine. I don't tell Tina I'm wrong if I don't think I'm wrong. Right. And, and we, we've had discussions before where she was pretty sure I was wrong. I was pretty sure she was wrong. Usually what we fa- find out is that both of us were wrong in certain aspects or respects. Mm-hmm. Right. And we, and we've got it, we've got it, but we fess up to that. But again, I don't say I'm wrong just to end an argument because then, then the argument hasn't ended because she knows I'm just placating her. And now I'm treating her like a child. Right. And, and I basically said, this isn't worth my time. There's one of the reasons why they say that a marriage is, is in danger, not when you're fighting, it's in danger when you stop fighting and the, and the issues are still there. A, rin, a good man it gets to the bottom of it. I'm um, so cutting a reel with what you just said because I think there are so many men my age who are about to get married and don't have that mindset. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to point out a comment that Karen Hamilton uh, just made. Good men don't fall into the trap or false advertising of porn. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. That is, um, that falls under the faithful cal- yeah. category. If you are faithful to your wife, you're not looking at porn. Yeah. Um, and that starts while you're a bachelor. Yeah. If you, if you start a habit of looking at porn when you're a bachelor and you think getting married is going to fix that, it's not. I've seen marriages fail um, over porn addiction that was a holdover from when the person was a teen. Yeah. And so, um, if, if you're into that kind of thing, you need to nip it in the bud and, and reject it. You've got to nip it in the bud or you will not be able to be what your wife needs. Yeah. You cannot provide her the safety she needs while you're looking at that. Um, it, it's cheating. So, yeah. All right. And then a couple of the other things we talked about is then, you know, again, a a good, a good man is making their wife feel safe both with them, um, but also from outside threats. Right. Again. And and, and that's what we differentiated with the nice guy, the the nice guy, she may feel safe around the nice guy because the nice guy isn't a threat, but she doesn't feel like the nice guy can protect him. A good man is someone she feels safe around because he's capable of protecting her. And, And that is an important distinction. Um, and so again, the, the whole point of this was just to, to try to put a greater specificity to some of these questions and some of these terms that get thrown around a lot. So we, we've provided some context for what we mean when we talk about these things. Now, somebody else might have a different context. And so they might look at what we're, we're talking about and getting offended about it. And if they get really offended, well, maybe you're a nice guy and you didn't man up. But anyway, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the point is that there are distinctions here and, um, and there's a lot of men in the chats right now that's saying, you know, all this is irrelevant if you can't find a woman that appreciates it. And, and this is, again, this is what I would say. I, I, am, I am fully willing to acknowledge that uh, feminist culture uh, on the whole today, I think devalues uh, these traits verbally. What's interesting is how much they still want them to be actually manifested in a man. There, there's a reason why you have all these things where we talk about um, where there's liberal, liberal women who prefer to date conservative men. Um, there, there's been studies on it. There was a recent report that came out of, of New York where it was talking about like kind of, uh, you know, high powered or we might call high value women in the, in the sense of they make a lot of money, they're CEOs, this, all this stuff. They don't, they don't want to date leftist men, right? They, they want to date men. They, they end up dating men that are more conservative because those men are strong and confident and they display those, those attributes that they want. So what I'm saying here is it, it is going to require men to step up into their, their role, regardless of what culture is telling them and regardless of what feminism may be trying to incentivize or disincentivize. And for some men, what that's going to mean, that's why when the whole issue of the passport port bros came up, right? Like I, again, I, I have a lot of issues with this whole, you know, how a lot of that stuff gets manipulated for human trafficking and abusive situations. But for, but for the guy that says, no, I just genuinely want to try to like, I've, I've tried in my own culture. I can't find a wife that wants the same things I want. And so I'm going to invest the time, not just show up, not just go to a website. I'm actually going to invest the time and trying to find a wife from a culture that is still, you know, that still values those sort of, of things that I would like in a wife and that teaches women to, and, and that, and again, it's not just teaches women as the society is teaching them. It's the women in that country value the things that I'm going to bring to the table. I understand why they're doing that. Like, I, I don't, I get it. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I don't think there's any magic button that anyone's going to push where 
men are going to, you know, okay, I don't, I don't have to be all these things right here um, in order to correct this. Like, no, we, we still do. We still have to strive for that. Um, and I, and I think what's going to end up happening is that over time, women are come going to come back around to responding to that in the way that, I agree. that we, that we would like in the way that we appreciate. Um, but if it's one of those things where it's like, well, screw that, I'm not going to do it. And they're going to see what they're missing. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to correct the situation. And we can say that sucks. We can say whatever else, but I think that's the truth. And so that's why I think there needs to be an emphasis on once again, men realizing that your job is not to be the nice guy as we've described here. Your job is to be the good man. Um, and, and good men do, I believe inevitably attract good women, especially if you're putting yourselves into those situations where the, the good women that you're looking for actually exist. And it's probably not the club. And unfortunately, in a lot of ways it's, it's not in a lot of our university departments now. Um, but they're still out there. All right. We got a couple more. We got it. We have, I have to ask one question before yeah. I forget it. Tina, do you think that strong men take the hot, crazy matrix into account when dating? Um, I don't know that they, uh, have the awareness to actually do that, but I do think that they do what you would call like thin slicing in their head. I think they, they do, you know, when they look at a situation and they can kind of dismantle it in their head very quickly and decide cost benefit of analysis, they kind of do that, I think, um, to some degree, but the, here's the problem is, um, good man, bad man, or indifferent Men are very, very driven by what they see, and it is women. They have the power of boobs and that type of thing, and they, and they can and they will use them. And so, even a good guy can totally be lured in by a woman who he should not be going for because her assets um, <laughs> are very attractive to him, and his sometimes his uh, brain, like maybe the blood is leaving his brain and going somewhere else and not, uh, helping him think clearly. Um, but I, I don't think that I don't, I think every guy should guard against that type of thing. Yeah. (laughs) All right. That was a good answer too. (laughs) All right. We got a couple of final super chats here. David Harold. Thank you again. I spent several years wasting my time being a nice guy and finally got married when I became a good man. Um, yeah, I, I get it. Like I, I will say through, through high school, I was, um, you know, again, I, I try to, I, do, you, do you know what he hates it when I say it this way? But I, I will say, I will say this much. I played it a lot more cool with Tina than I did any other girl I had been interested in in high school. Um, because I was like, this, like, I suck at this. Like, I am not good at this. I would watch guys some of them were buddies of mine who just treated women horribly, treated girls horribly yeah. and, and dude cleaning house. Girls <laughs> like were they were all over him. They were, we're not mentioning any I'm names. Not, we're not. not mentioning any names, but, but yeah. And, and girls are just all over this dude. And I'm sitting here going, what the hell? So for anybody that thinks like I, Nick, you're forties, you, you have no idea what it's like now. I still remember thinking, how is it that this other dude is getting away with this crap? Right. And so I remember my senior year, I'm like, forget this. Right. Like, so I, I started, you know, I, I started realize, okay, I, I'm interested in Tina. She seems to be kind of interested in me. I'm like, no, forget this. I'm playing it cool this time. I'll be like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to the army. Um, like I'm going to, I'm, I'm look, I'm leaving for Fort Benning, Georgia. We've been dating for like probably about he hadn't six told months. Me he loved me. Yet. Hadn't told I loved her yet. Um, uh, we've been dating for about six months. Um, knew, Knew I loved her, but I wasn't saying that. I wasn't saying nothing. And then I'm going off to basic training. And I knew, I'm like, I'm going to go off to basic training. She's way too hot for me. Like this is, as soon as I'm like out of the picture for an extended period of time, she's gone. And so right before I leave for basic training, I'm like, look, I'm going to be in basic training. Clearly I'm not going to be dating anyone. Right? You make it sound like you acted so aloof with me, but you really I didn't weren't. act that aloof. Okay. I, but what I did was I said, no, I was, I was so affectionate. You know, I liked you yeah. on the whole deal. But at that point I said, but he look, wasn't obsessing. I said, oh, look, I'm going to be gone for, for three months, right. For basic training. Like I'm clearly not going to be dating anyone at you know, in, yeah. in Fort, in- Fort Benning, Georgia doing going through infantry school. Um, if you want to date someone else during this time, that's up to you. And she was actually very mad. I said that I was offended. She was offended that I said that. Um, yeah. but then I, and then when I left for basic training I remember like an instantly thinking, Holy crap. If she actually does date somebody else, I'm going to be devastated. But 
It was that, it was that, nope, I'm not, I'm not doing the, you're not going to stick with me through basic training because I didn't want her sticking with me through basic training just because she was a good person. I wanted to do it because she really wanted to do it. Like that's what she wanted. And she wrote me every single day of basic training, every single day of basic training. I did. Um, All right. Here we go. Uh, Isaac Gorski, (laughs) too long, didn't read, threaten women, got it. (laughs) That was probably in (laughs) reference to our conversation about, yeah, that's not what we were were going for, Isaac, but uh, but thank you. (laughs) And then Jesse Zimmett said, hey, Nick, a bit cheap uh, with the super chat, but uh, what do I do if I'm not very talkative? Greetings from South Africa. No, no, no. Hey, Jesse, thank you very much. Really appreciate the the super chat. Um, What do you do if you're not very talkative? Um. So obviously I'm, I'm a fairly talkative guy. Um, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to pretend like I, I share that perspective. Uh, what I will say though, is that I'm more of a talkative person and I found someone that appreciated that. Um, I think there's other women that are appreciate. Uh, uh, Sometimes people that are not very talkative really like someone who is talkative. And the reason yeah. why is because that way they don't have to think up what to say. And, yeah. and so I would say probably, figure out why you're not talkative because if it's because you're nervous about saying something wrong, maybe you could put in some work on that. If it's just because you're kind of stoic and you don't have a whole lot to say, you'll still need to find a way to let somebody into your mind. Um, And so sometimes when you're not talkative, you don't give up a lot of information. So it's hard for somebody to fall in love with someone they don't know. And if you're not talking to them, it's hard for them to know you. And so I think there is um, a little, even if you don't have to talk about nothing and and stupid thing, you don't have to talk about a bunch of like meaningless garbage, but when it comes to having conversations that really matter and asking questions about your life and your point of view on things, those are things that do matter and you will have to figure out a way to open up so somebody can get to know your mind. The other thing I would say too, is this goes back to the whole, you know, we, we use that term opposites attract a lot. And, and I, there's obviously an element of truth to that, but I think it's also kind of, um, what, what, what's, uh, capabilities which complement one another uh, attract. And so one of the things that I, I've noticed in my marriage with Tina is obviously there's, there's shared values, there's other things that we have in common, but there's a lot of other things too where the, the, um, the capability shift is complementary. If we all have the same capabilities, we wouldn't be adding additional value to the relationship. The fact that we have different capabilities and that we appreciate each other for those different capabilities that they bring that you don't bring is valuable. You may find someone, it it may be so to to the point with talking a lot, if you're not super talkative, but you're actually really, really good at listening and the feedback that you provide, you're you're still listening, you're still processing the information and the feedback that you provide may not, um, you know, may not take a lot for you to, a lot of words for you to explain, but it's still valuable and demonstrate that you are thinking about it. You might find someone that does like to talk a lot and loves the fact that you're really good at listening. If you are, right? Uh, there's some people that don't talk a lot and they're not good at listening, right? I, I would say that you're you're probably going to have to get better at, at, at you know one if you're if you're not good at either. But there's something to be said for someone that can just sit there and listen to a woman talk about the things that are on her mind and maybe provide. Um, feedback or, or insight when it's, um, valuable, but otherwise is, is perfectly capable and enjoys listening yeah. to them talk about their day and what they went through. And, um, and, and believe me, that's something that can be incredibly attractive, uh, for a woman. I, I think if there is, I think if there is one thing I could think of right off the bat that Tina wishes I was better at, and she's absolutely right. It is the ability to just sit there and listen with the intention of understanding instead of trying to jump ahead to, okay, what's the point of this? What do you need me to do? What's the, um, it's because my mind is kind of constantly racing. And so I have to do a much better job sometimes of just sitting there and being like, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop everything I'm doing and I'm going to provide undivided attention just with the purpose of, of understanding. Yeah. Um, that's, that can be difficult for me to do. And maybe it's something that's easier for you to do. And what ends up happening is you find somebody that maybe they're really, really good at, at talking and expressing things in a way that you appreciate when you're in social situations, they, they take care of the person that wants to have the chit chat. Um, and they really appreciate your ability to sit there and listen and understand and not have to, you know, yeah. fill up the silence. There's a thoughtfulness in being somebody that, uh, that uses few words yeah. because, uh, I have some friends who aren't very talkative, but they are some of the funniest people I know because when they do actually have something to say, yeah. it's 
it's usually really on point. Um, I've got one friend who's a scientist and she has the best sense of humor. Yeah. And when she, when she explains something in her field, she's amazing at explaining it, but she's not, she, she doesn't just use up the space. I, I think it also depends on like who you're around. Yeah. Like, it, around certain people, talkative person. Around other people, you know, I don't shut up. Yeah. You know, so I think it's also about finding a good person that you vibe with and mesh with. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, I think we've, uh, I think we've gone through everything. I hope we've answered all the super chats. I want to appreciate all the uh, participation, both in the super chats and just in the, the community chat. Yeah, it's been awesome. Yeah. Also, hey, consider uh, jumping on uh, Circle. We'll, that's our community chat area we'll put in there. We're getting, gosh, we're, it's really grown over the last couple of months, which is, which is great to see. Um, but yeah, I just really appreciate everyone's participation. Also, two two more little things to let you guys all, all know about. Um, one, we, do, we did finally open up our own shop. So for, for anybody that is looking for, for quality mug swag, uh, we now have that on the very appropriately named only mugs.com. So if you go to our, if you go to our Instagram or you go on YouTube, we'll also put it on there. Actually, we got it on the screen right now, um, with our, our tread around and, and find out, but we've also got a lot of our other little quippy mugs. If you follow us on, on our uh, social media and you see kind of our, my good, little good smart pricing alecky. too. We've tried really hard on the pricing yeah. side of this. Yeah. We, well, we went with American producers and, and, uh, and whatnot. So again, hope you guys enjoy that. Also want to once again, give a plug for good ranchers, good ranchers.com. Again, some really good, uh, some really good new deals. You're going to get, uh, you're going to get, a, a cut off of your order if you use promo code Nick and they are offering that free it's the free ham with the subscription right that's correct free ham with the subscription and again this is not the it's not the $20 well, ham you're picking up I need to give a quick note to that if you order before December 11th it, the ham will arrive before Christmas oh there you go before December 11th it will arrive before Christmas and this is going to be like that quality smoked ham I never really uh, I honestly I never really knew the difference and then many years ago, I went, we had a local place here that did like the Virginia's, you know, they did Virginia, um, um, salt smoked hams. Yeah. And, um, and I remember going in there going, gosh, what, this is, this seems a lot more. It was like, like a $60 ham. Yeah. What, what's the deal? <laughs> and then I had it and it was like, holy crap, where has this been all my life? Like there is a difference. And again, they're going to throw it in for free, like a hundred dollar value ham for free. So that's a pretty big deal. Use promo code Nick and then uh, check out goodranchers.com. Again, a great way to support us is to support the people that advertise through us. That's Not right. to mention that I think we have, I, I think we're in the top 10% of wittiest ad transitions for sure. 100%. on the internet. Oh, yeah. In, in a survey, especially when I'm in control of the episode, in a, <laughs> in a survey that was conducted by me five seconds ago, I right, came up right. with that statistic. Accurate, so it must accurate. be, it must be true. So once again, thank you all very much for joining us. We hope this was helpful. Run over to the community chat to give us ideas for episodes you would like to see in the future. We might do a couple relationship ones just because Christian's gone and he just hates it when we do the relationship ones, but we are waiting for him to get back. Uh, we are waiting for the master of history. Christian Hines to be able to return. We're, we keep trying out all these names. One of Master them, one, of Doom. One of them's going to stick. Yeah. Coming back because we got some other issues that we want to talk about. A lot of exciting content coming up in the next month. Plus, we'll probably be sharing with you guys some more about some plans for 2024 that we're pretty excited about. Yeah. So go check out the shop at onlymugs.com. You can also look at uh, treadaroundandfindout.com. Com? Yeah, dot com. Try, dot com. And then also check out Good Ranchers as well. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next episode.